This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in to today's newest podcast of VORW International, the voice of the Report of the Week. Well, I'm go- <laughs> the show is going out to you sometime in mid-March 2021, I'm just going to be completely frank with you. I don't know the date uh, that this program is actually going to premiere. So just sometime in mid-March, right? Probably the week of the 14th, you know? So sometime, I'd say, between the 16th and the 20th. Because when it comes to editing, there might be a few things to smooth out. But anyway, these are just little things. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. If you're listening to this, I got the show out. And that's what's important in the end. Hope everyone listening in is doing and feeling all right. Tonight's show isn't going to feature much original discussion on my end, although there are a few important updates on the radio side of things. And then we're just going to open up the email. We're going to get to plenty of interesting listener emails, and uh, we're just going to let the show take whatever course it does with that, but lots of interesting, varied topics uh, in the broadcast. For those of you, as I say in every program, for those of you watching this on YouTube, if you would like to turn your attention to the video, we have a number of lovely pieces of fan art featured here for your viewing pleasure. If you would like to submit a piece of fan art, just let your creative juices flow, so to speak, compose whatever piece you wish, submit it to me via email at vorw, I-N-F-O at gmail.com, and then let me know how you would like to be credited. You will be credited in writing in the description, and also verbally at the beginning of the program. That's the very least I can do uh, for the fan art that you would submit. We have five pieces of fan art featured in the show tonight. The first is from Joan in California. She says, I wanted to submit my quick little doodle just to say thanks for the inspiration you bring to a lot of us listeners. Thank you, Joan, for your fan art. The next piece is from Lily Tuttle in South Carolina, who says, You are the artist. Love your work. Thank you for your fan art. The third piece comes from Kirsten in Manila, Philippines, who said, Your pickle lid story made me snort. I'm no artist, but I was inspired to do a caricature of that angry pickle lid. It's a breath of fresh air from these boring flowers I use for practice drawing. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. I really like the mustache that you put on the pickle lid. That is, that is the perfect touch, I must say. Very nicely done. The fourth piece of fan art comes from Brad, who also includes a comment, writing, I really appreciate your attitude in today's world. There's so much toxicity, vitriol, and finger-pointing on the internet and in the world in general. I find your shows to be a much-needed breath of fresh air. Thank you, Brad, for your kind words and fan art. And the fifth and final piece of fan art is credited to Andrew J. McCarthy, who says, Here is some fan art. It is based on the May 2017 video where you reviewed Burger King's Mac and Cheetos and that semi-truck almost smushed you. I remember that. That's Thank you. A nice piece right there. So a huge thank you to everyone out there who composed some fantastic fan art. And if again, if you are feeling creatively inclined, it would be an absolute pleasure to feature your fan art in the next broadcast. Finally, this I will say once and once only in the entire program. Keep in mind that sometimes the subjects that I discuss in this broadcast lead to it being demonetized due to the fact that I don't really hold back on certain issues and we talk about some current events. And if the show gets demonetized, it gets demonetized. I just want to do my show the way I want to do it. Consider supporting this broadcast with a donation if you like what you hear. You may do so via PayPal at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. Likewise, if you'd like to advertise on this broadcast, that is an alternate way of supporting it and supporting you too. You can promote your goods, your service, your music, your website, your YouTube channel. Simply inquire if you would like to advertise 
at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. A lot of the time, it's the sponsors that help keep this broadcast going. Take a minute to listen into this message, and then we'll continue the show. This is V-O-R-W. The future of crypto is here. Rubik Exchange. Interest in cross-chain decentralized finance, DeFi solutions, is rising. Here's why RBC is the future of trading cryptocurrency. Rubik is a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange. Unlike other exchanges, such as Uniswap, Rubik bridges between financial assets and does so with lower fees. This isn't your ordinary coin that brings nothing to the crypto ecosystem. Rubik is a gateway to the future of cryptocurrency. Rubik is a multi-chain DeFi ecosystem, which features cross-chain, peer-to-peer, and instant swaps across multiple blockchains, including Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Matic. Rubik is a complete, one-stop, decentralized platform. And coming soon, Rubik will also help your money grow with yield farming by providing liquidity for trades you will be rewarded with RBC tokens when trades are executed. So why not check it out now? When financial regulators decide to crack down on crypto, Rubik and its exchange will be the gateway to multiple exchanges. The Central Crypto Exchange. The future of crypto is here. Rubik Exchange. That's rubik.exchange. Rubik.exchange. All right, so as I was saying... There are two radio-related announcements that I wanted to make, and then again, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I really haven't much original discussion on my end. I mean, I can sit here and complain for an hour about how I'm feeling physically, you know, just not feeling the best, but I don't want to do that, you know? It's just, it's not what I want to do. It's not what this show is for. So instead, on to brighter and greener pastures, we will uh, well, we'll share a few updates, and I think they're pretty good updates, to tell you the truth. And then we will just open up the email, and we have lots of very interesting pieces of correspondence, some good questions, some good topic suggestions. I think it'll just make, to yes, repeatedly use this word for a good show, it'll make for a good show. On to the updates. Number one, for any shortwave listeners out there, this is very, very, very important. My main broadcast to North America has moved to a new time. If you have a shortwave radio, or you are thinking about getting a shortwave radio to hear my broadcast, I do an additional show, in addition to this one, so it's totally separate, uh, four hours of additional content each and every week, only heard on the shortwave because I play some music on it and you can't have that online. I often discuss uh, news of the day, random topics, and then I play some listener requested music. It's just a fun hour of some serious discussion and some fun, uh, good music as well. I do new shows every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and more often than not Sunday evenings. And you can tune in if you're in North America on the shortwave frequency of 5850 kilohertz. That's 5.850 megahertz. 5850 kilohertz, 5.850 megahertz, at the time of 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific. For a while, this broadcast was one hour earlier, but it is now at 10 p.m. Eastern, that's 6 p.m. Pacific, 0200 UTC, on 5850 kHz, Thursday through Sunday. So I hope you could tune into that show, too. It has moved times. So that's the first update. Uh, so far, since we did the time change, um, feedback has been very good. The time change actually seems to be working out um, beneficially to a number of listeners. Now, on to a second note, and I think this is some very good news, at least me personally. I, it's something that I'm very excited about. And while it may not apply to a ton of listeners, if you're in the right place, maybe this will be exciting for you too. I don't know. 
but I am pleased to announce that my radio show, VORW, Radio International, is also going to be syndicated on an additional radio station. If you are located in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, you will now be able to hear my broadcast at the time of 9 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday evening, on radio station WITA, 1490 AM. I already heard from a couple listeners in Knoxville, and it's a station that covers the immediate vicinity very good. It covers the city of Knoxville nicely, and a little bit of the surrounding area, but really it just it, it should provide localized, very strong coverage uh, to the city of Knoxville, Tennessee. So again, a new listening opportunity, AM 1490, WITA, at the time of 9 p.m. Eastern, every Saturday evening. So that's one way that you can listen in if you're in Knoxville and you don't have a shortwave radio, or if you want that strong signal, uh, just tune into that local station. Now that's in addition to a few other AM airings that we have, such as uh, WNQM AM 1300 in Nashville, KYAH 540 for Utah, and a couple other stations, but a pleasure to add this one to the lineup. If you are in Knoxville, uh, feel free to send in a signal report and let me know how reception is at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And with those updates out of the way, let's just continue the broadcast now and go directly into the mailbag portion of the show. Now, I always give a little bit of an introduction as to what this is, so no one is lost, and, you know, the name is very straightforward. This is a program, or I suppose a part of this program, dedicated to reading listener correspondence. There is no topic. There is no format. I just open up the email and see what is sent my way. There is a blank slate, and if you would like to participate, well, it's listeners just like you that even allow this program to be a thing. So, if you have any questions, any comments, any pieces of feedback, any topic suggestions, if you read something interesting, if you saw something interesting, you watched an interesting movie, saw something in the news, if you want to share a story, an anecdote, or anything, you are more than welcome to correspond and send in an email at VORW. I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Again, that's V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Take your time, but it would be great to hear from you. You can write as much or as little as you would like. You can write as frequently or infrequently as you would like to as well. You don't have to write at all. But again, any questions you might have for me, any topic suggestions, anything you want to hear my thoughts on, etc., Write about anything you would like, but the only way to get in touch with me for this program is via email to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And while I can't make any promises, I certainly try my best to respond to whatever feedback I can. And as you see, I'm going to be here for hours um, responding to emails in this show, so I would say there's a good chance that your email will get responded to in the next one. Likewise... As we said just a couple minutes ago, so I don't want to sound like a broken record, but if you'd like to submit a, fee- a piece of fan art, uh, simply send it to me at that email address, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Upload it as an email attachment, or you can upload it to a third-party image hosting website, and then send me the link. But again, just via that email address, and please let me know how you would like to be credited. And with that said... Sit back, relax, and enjoy the broadcast. This is VORW International. So tonight, we're just going to try to read as many emails as we can. Respond, of course, to them. I'm not just going to read them exclusively and then not say anything. That would be rather strange. And we'll just go from there, you know? We'll just see what we get. Make of it what we will, right? So... I've just got the email open here, and we'll just go through them, and uh, we will see what we have, right? Alright. Again, like the last one, 
A lot of the emails are shortwave-related, but we have a number of pieces of correspondence mixed in. Let's start with this one. Hi, John. Long time not writing you. I've always listened to the VORW podcast on Spotify, though. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how to deal with failure. I've been struggling with depression the last couple of years, but it has gotten worse over the last five months, I would say. I've been trying to find a decent job for the career that I'm studying. I have good grades, and I would say I'm a pretty capable person to do that sort of thing, but I've applied to more than 200 jobs, not joking, and uh, you did include a, an image that did say applied to 175 offers, and that's just one of the job pages. Of course, I have applied in others, but this is just to give an example. So as I was saying, this has made me feel pretty depressed because most of my friends are currently working. I'm 24 and feel like I'm going nowhere. Maybe I don't have what it takes to work as an accountant. Anyway, sorry if I wrote too much. I know you get a lot of emails, and this is pretty difficult to answer all of them. Thank you so much for all your words you give in every video and podcast. They make me feel a little bit better whenever I listen to what you have to say. Take care. Listening in from Peru. So over there in Peru, tuned in. Well, dealing with failure, you know, it is tough. And I know that there's no way to sugarcoat it. I mean, sometimes when things don't go our way, you know, it really does hurt. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, we make plans that, well, I'm going to do this and it's all going to go smoothly and, you know, you envision it and then it doesn't happen. And yeah, it does. It, it's awful. It's no good. Now, first and foremost, I'd like to recommend a broadcast that I recorded, and I, let me just find it for you right here, because I will send this to you personally. But I'm going to send you, and I found them, a few podcasts that I recorded that I just think spend much more time on this subject than, you know, I would be able to right now. Uh, the first one I'm going to send you is a program I recorded in October of 2019, and it's called How to Overcome Failure. It was a lecture I gave then. It's 55 minutes long, um, but again, it certainly covers that topic much more, I think, in much more detail than I may be able to right now. Another one that I'm going to uh, attach your way is a program from, let's find out when this one was. It was from May of 2019. It's called Don't Give Up, What to Do If You're Contemplating Quitting. And uh, it's an hour and seven minutes long. Now, this is just stuff that if you want to listen to it in the background and whatnot, make of it what you will. But these are two things that I'm going to send to you that uh, hopefully will will be of a little bit of assistance. One thing just to remember, you know, just specifically in regards to these job applications, granted, I imagine it must be very disheartening when you see that you apply to all these, you get one, let's say, rejection after the next, after the next, or it just doesn't seem as though there is any interest, and you see what your friends are doing, and you look at yourself and your situation, and you can't help but feel down. But just remember that it only takes one of these applications getting accepted that will be the world of difference between being where you are now and possibly having that job as an accountant. You know, it just takes one of these companies, one of these firms, one of these businesses to look it over and pursue this application further. It only takes one, and that's all that you need. That's all that you're looking for. So while these numbers can be daunting, while it can be very intimidating and very disheartening, please don't give up. You just don't know what the future holds, and it just takes that one successful application that, again, is going to be a complete and total game changer. So again, I'm going to send you these two programs, and I think that that will definitely... I just recommend listening to those. Again, just have them on in the background, make of it what you will, but I think that it should certainly... I hope it helps. I know I can't make any promises, but I hope it does. 
Now we got a lot of emails about uh, the sartorial aspect of the broadcast last week in regards to suits. So we're going to be getting to a lot of those, and we'll just mix them in here and there. Uh, this email comes in from Vuk, who writes, Just a few reactions and thoughts on the suit issue you raised in your last show. I'll skip the societal and cultural reasons I think are responsible for the disappearance of suits, but on a more psychological level, I understand it is very difficult for people to oppose peer pressure. A few years ago, I started wearing a bowler hat on a day-to-day -day basis. It was a beautiful handmade hat, and I enjoyed wearing it. As a matter of fact, people often forget how useful hats are. Rain becomes much less of an issue, and the scalp is kept warm. Of course, the looks of it are great in my opinion. All in all, I enjoyed wearing that hat. But after a few months, I stopped wearing it because almost every time I went outside, I would have to deal with something new. It is unbelievable how a mere piece of clothing can trigger a vast variety and array of reactions and emotions. I got everything, from raised eyebrows to incredulity to incomprehension to exuberant admiration to questions to being called an Englishman to various comments to is it a real hat all the way to full-blown aggressive behavior. At times, I was under the impression that all these people have never seen something as revolting as a hat in their whole life. It is a bit ridiculous, is it not? So I got tired of all of that and stopped wearing the hat. But since I was so used to wearing something on my head all the time, I switched to the fisherman's cap. I've been wearing that ever since. It's less remarkable, and I don't get bothered ever so often. Maybe once every six months someone calls me a fisherman or asks where the boat is, but that's fine. I think the situation is similar, albeit on a much lesser level, with suits. Even people who would wear them are discouraged by peer pressure. Are you going to a wedding, and why are you dressed like that? Repeated a few times are enough questions to discourage the vast majority of people, especially younger individuals, to dress as they like. On a personal level, I was reluctant to wear ties for a long time. For some reason, I felt a tie was somewhat of a sign of distinction, and I believed I had to earn the honor or the privilege of wearing one, like a medal if you want. But I always said to myself, when you're done with your studies, you'll wear them ties, and it'll be okay. I also happen to have a collection of vintage silk top hats. Now, I think, of course, they are things of beauty, and I am always ecstatic when I find an old one that fits my head at a flea market. Restoring them is something that relaxes me a lot, but of course it is useless to say that I'll never wear them in public because I don't want to be causing riots right now. Interestingly, I read somewhere that the first original top hats that were worn in England might have actually caused riots, but my knowledge of the subject stops there. So here's how I solved my personal issues of this whole situation. My plan is to buy a house in the countryside. Over there, there are much fewer people. Everyone knows everyone, so people already know you. They get accustomed to how you look and what you wear. And even if at first you're the guy with the hat to the local baker, very quickly he gets to know you and starts calling you by your own name. Overall, I'll wear what I want on my own property and won't care a single bit about other people's opinions. I will then be far away from the bustling annoyance of cities. But to answer your question, no, I hardly see anyone wear suits anymore. I hope this wasn't too long. All the best from Vuk. Well, thank you for your email. And I understand completely your views on, you know, the hat wearing, etc., and I know especially, you know, it's something that people, I wish people weren't this way, but it's just how they are. And that's one of the most difficult, difficult things I've experienced, too, when it comes to wearing what I want. Now, I don't know if this is true everywhere, but I think as you start to get older, you're still going to have some people that will make comments and make fun of you, but it's... 
It's at its worst when you're younger. I'd say especially in your teens. Now I just say this from my own experience. I first started dressing well when I was like 10 years old. And I really started seriously doing it um, when I was maybe 13. And that's just when I committed to it fully. But I remember that. I remember, you know, at first, when I would go to school, I would just try to dress, you know, nicely, but not in the full suits. Like, this is when I was in, you know, the eighth grade or so, the seventh, eighth grade. Um, so I was 13 or so. Well, I would wear, like, a nice shirt and pants that aren't jeans, you know. I stopped wearing blue jeans and stopped wearing shorts. But, you know, I wouldn't necessarily tuck the shirt in and I'd just wear nice pants and a collared shirt, usually. And then eventually, you know, I would start changing it up and I would start tucking the shirts in. And then I would start, instead of just wearing you know, button-down shirts, I'd start wearing dress shirts, but no tie. And then you make the big leap to finally putting on a tie. And then once you do that enough, then you could put on a, you know, maybe a vest or a sweater or something, then a sport coat, and then finally full-blown suits. You know, that was the evolution that I went through over the years, especially, you know, when wearing that sort of stuff in high school. And yes, I wore full-blown suits when I was in high school, and you know, I don't really care if people said things behind my back, but it was a very gradual change so that, you know, no one really questioned it by the end of it. But I do remember, especially early on when I first started dressing this way, it was tough. You know, you always go out and people, again, especially when you're young, they want to know why you're dressed up, because obviously you have to be wearing this sort of clothing for an occasion. Uh, not just for, you know, the sake that you want to wear it, but, you know, you go into a wedding, you go, and eventually, I remember one time I would go to this one restaurant, and uh, <laughs> I guess there was some sort of miscommunication, and, you know, the waiter got me confused with someone else, and I just didn't want to deal with it, so he was, he said, oh, uh, how was the violin recital? <laughs> I just, I was just done with it, I said, oh, it was great, <laughs> you know. And then every uh, every time you just, oh, recital, yeah, yeah, I was, you know, doing another performance. Because I just didn't want to deal with it, you know, so I just went with it. But I do remember, you know, especially when I was younger, you get funny looks, you get people that say things. I remember one of the times that made me feel really bad about the way that I dressed. I remember this was 2011, and I went out to the mall on a Friday night. And uh, granted, you know, even in 2011, some of the malls were actually pretty... It had a pretty decent turnout. And um, I was there, I was getting some food in the food court. And I hear this cackling laughter. Like, you know, you get some people, they laugh so hard you think they're going to die or something. Of course, I um, I turn my head and I see this group of... You know, kids about my age, probably. I didn't recognize them, so they weren't from my school or anything, but obviously my, you know, same age as me. And, oh, they were just laughing hysterically at the fact that, you know, here I was wearing a full suit. It was, like, the funniest thing to them. They were pointing and laughing. It was quite surreal, obviously, but, you know, you feel really... It's like you feel ashamed of yourself after that. You feel like you're doing something that you're not supposed to be what, just by dressing respectfully, trying to appear with dignity in public? I don't understand how some people perceive anything wrong with that. It's such a shame that some people are that way. But it's tough. Yeah, you have the reactions, you know. And hats, I guess, you know, that's a whole other can of worms. I've never really been much of a hat wearer. But again, when I was younger, I would experiment with a few hats here and there, and you know, the reactions are similar. Uh, it's just one of those things. Now, I think that maybe I got off lucky a little bit because, again, you know, even in the early 2010s, in New York, in New Jersey, like we were saying in the last broadcast, a number of people still wore suits. So it wasn't like completely 
foreign a concept to be dressing nicely. Although, again, for someone my age, it was still kind of weird. But at least the suit wasn't totally dead at that time. But I, I, I imagine, like, if I were in a small town... I have nothing against this state, but it's just an example. Like in Oklahoma, let's say, where no one wears suits, and... And I started dressing that way, you know, the reactions may have been more abrasive. Maybe not. I, I don't know. But I remember that. It was tough, and it was a difficult thing for me to overcome. But, you know, the choice that I faced was, do I want to cave into the peer pressure and not be myself anymore? Or do I just want to kind of throw caution to the wind, deal with whatever whatever faces me, and be the person that I really want to be and how I'm happy. And it was around that age, you know, around 2011 or so, especially when these negative reactions were happening, I decided people might give me some flack for it, people might not like it, but this is what I want to wear. And I'm going to continue to dress this way, I'm not going to cave into the peer pressure. And I am so incredibly thankful that I didn't. But I know that in this case it's easier... It's easier to say it and think back to my case. You know, you can't just apply that to every situation. Every situation's different. And I completely understand why you don't... You know, you like the baller hats, but why you don't wear them out anymore, I get it. I wouldn't want to put up with that either, to tell you the truth. You know, the saddest thing, and I, I know you you understand this, isn't it sad that you can't just, you know, go out to the store with a top hat on anymore and not have people just not look at you like you're some sort of alien? Wouldn't that be nice, though, if you just could and people would leave you alone? It would be... Oh, that would be awesome. If people really were that way, and granted, folks haven't been in probably, you know, 90 years at this point, because... You know, in the 30s, there were still a couple people that wore top hats, but not a lot. But if people were less abrasive, oh yeah, I'd, I guarantee I would put forth the investment. I would buy a silk top hat, and I would wear that thing out. I mean, I, I most certainly would. Unfortunately, though, you know, people will laugh at you, they'll mock you. I bet people, if you wore a top hat out, you have someone they'll try to knock it off your head etc. It's sad. The thing that I'm just kind of glad about in my situation is that I just get left alone for wearing a suit these days, but, you know, again, I go out so rarely, you know, who knows. But, like, I'm sitting here, I haven't left the house at all today, I haven't left it yesterday, but here I am, still sitting here in the middle of the night, wearing a Nice vest and black pants and a wing collar, shirt with a blue necktie, you know, but I'm not going anywhere, this is what I want to wear. But you know, some people will find that weird and they'll, you know, make snarky remarks, etc. I mean, they have every right to, but I just wish people accepted the fact that, you know, some people dress differently. Some people dress very formally, some very casually, you know, but... I don't know, I just think wearing a hat is inoffensive, and it's just a shame the way people are. So I know where you're coming from, and I'm sorry that they put you through this. It's it's sad, but I understand. You know, I get it. I've been there, too. So thank you for your email. Continuing the show, we have an email coming in now. Let's open it up. From Fatima, who writes... During the most recent upload, you did a four-hour podcast and asked if people around the area wore suits. I live in the United States, and people definitely wear suits at church and formal events. I did not say the state because I do not want to be associated with any stereotypes. Sorry. So I've been working on starting a web comic, and I was wondering how you felt about a character being based off of you. I was pretty anxious that if I did base it off of you, sort of how martial law is inspired off of Markiplier from the webtoon Let's Play, people would come after me 
to end my non-existent career. Please let me know what you think about this. Respectfully, Fatima. Well, thank you for your email, and uh, certainly, you know, only divulge whatever information you feel comfortable doing so. You know, that's that's why I say whenever you write in, it's a blank slate, right? And include what you wish. You're never forced to say anything more than you want, you know? that's I want to give anyone listening the freedom to express what they wish and withhold what they wish likewise. Uh, now, in regards to your question... In regards to the webcomic, I don't, it's funny. I don't. I know the name Markiplier, but I don't even know who he is, um, really. I, I know that's very strange of me to say, but I just don't keep in touch with... I, I mean, I know I do YouTube, but I don't really watch people on the platform. I just listen to music, and it's, I know I'm so out of touch. It's just kind of funny. Um, now, in regards to um, basing a character off of me, um, I'll just send you an email for more information. I probably shouldn't really have a problem with that, but I'll just get some additional details to see what everything is looking like, and uh, I think it should go all right. So thank you, though, for having the courtesy to ask. I know some folks would just go ahead and do that without ever even sending in an email, so I, I respect the fact that you're even sending in an email about that, so thank you very much. Email comes in from Richard in Connecticut. It's been a month since I was first introduced to your content. I have to say it has been a wild ride watching your past reviews as well as a few podcasts. Your passion for shortwave radio has inspired me to purchase one of my own, mainly to listen to your radio show the proper way. As a novice, do you have any suggestions of radios I should purchase? I can say I enjoy your content for multiple reasons, but it's your positive attitude and push for mutual respect and kindness that brings it all together. Hope all is well. Richard in Connecticut. So thank you, Richard. Uh, this is a question that I answer in every single uh, show, but for good reason. I get it asked a lot, and, you know, shortwave is a medium that I am passionate about, and it is one that I most certainly will promote by any means necessary. <laughs> you know, I will certainly go ahead and uh, promote the medium any chance I can get. So, in regards to shortwave radios, now there are a lot out there, and there are a lot of brands. You know, there are more than just the one brand I am going to recommend you, so just bear that in mind. If you see something better, maybe go for it. The golden rule when it comes down to radios I have learned is that you get what you pay for. By that I mean a radio that's $50 is going to have an exponentially better performance than a $10 radio. The radios that I recommend are in the $50 range. So you can jot these down, and I will send this to you in writing, and if anyone has any questions about shortwave and would like radio recommendations, I will be more than happy to supply them. The Texun, that's T-E-C-S-U-N, Texun, PL-380 or the Texun PL-310ET. Those are two radios that I would say that's the gold standard of what I recommend. I think that they're just fantastic. And I think they are effective. I think they're durable and I think they're affordable likewise. The two radios are pretty much identical to one another. I recommend them both because they are so similar to one another. If one is just not available to purchase, then just go with the other one as an alternative, because again, they are almost exactly the same thing. Another radio I personally recommend, if you have a little bit of money, is the Texun PL660 receiver. Another radio, if you're interested, is the C Crane Skywave. That's C Crane, C R A N E, Skywave receiver. And there are a number of other receivers out there, too. Uh, a number of good companies. Eaton is a good company. Cato is a good company. Grundig. 
Any old Radio Shack, some of that can be decent. Again, Texun, Dijen, and a number of others. There's one radio that I have available front and center on the Amazon shop, but I always advertise this one with a stipulation. And I really should say I get a small proceed from each radio I sell, but it's about... For a $50, a $50 radio, I get about $0.10, cents, so I'm not making any money here. This is just a medium that I'm passionate about, and I try to promote it any means that I can. So there's no financial motive here. But the radio, which I always have a stipulation regarding, is the Reticus V115 shortwave radio. I'm looking at it right now. It's $16.99. You might look at it in comparison to the Texun PL380, and you might say, well, this looks similar to it. It looks similar, looks about the same size. Uh, why shouldn't I just spend 16 bucks on this instead of the $50 on the Texun radio? And the thing is, is that, yes, the Radicast V115 radio is better than no radio at all if you really want to get one, let's say for an emergency situation. You know, believe me, if the lights go out, um, let's say due to civil unrest, natural disaster, etc., you'll be able to pick up stations. You'll be able to listen to the local stations, especially. Um, but some of the strongest shortwave broadcasts, you'll still be able to pull in with the Redicast receiver. However, this receiver is not as sensitive as the Texun radios. By that, I mean it is not as efficient at pulling in shortwave stations as the Texun radios are. The Texun radios are far, 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 far superior than the Reticas in terms of picking up stations. So let's say I have a Reticas V115 receiver and a Texun PL380 right next to each other. And I'm trying to hear Radio New Zealand International, which should be heard at this time in North America with, let's say, a fair to good signal, because it's beamed out to the Pacific, but of course the signal will, you know, continue on into North America. The Texun receiver will be able to pick it up. There might be a little bit of static, there might be a little bit of fading. You can get an external uh, wire antenna, which I also recommend, and it'll come in clearly, but it'll do a good job, and it'll be able to pick it up, and it'll be cool to listen to this station, you know, all the way from New Zealand. The Redicus receiver, you won't hear a thing. It'll just be static. And that's it. That's the difference. Now, you'll have no problem picking up some strong stations. Like, you'll probably be able to listen to WWCR uh, out of Nashville. They get a great signal to North America. Some of WRMI's frequencies, they're in Miami. Well, their offices are in Miami. Their, the transmitter is in Okeechobee. You'll probably be able to hear Radio Havana, Cuba, and maybe a couple more stations, but that's about it. So you see what I'm saying there? You'll be able to hear the strong stations that are directly targeting you. Mind you, you know, I'm not saying you can pick up the Voice of Greece, or Radio Romania International, or the Voice of Africa from Sudan, or the Voice of Nigeria, or All India Radio, because I just don't think the receiver will be able to pull that in. So with a lower price, you're sacrificing quality, and that's why I would recommend the $50 radios, because if you're getting it to listen to stations, get a radio that does a good job, you know, unless, again, you're just looking for something, just anything to have. That's why I recommend the, uh, the Redicast receiver, if you're interested. So if anyone has any radio questions, as you can see, I just go on and on and on, because I love talking about radio. So, um, hey, just send them in. I, I love talking about this stuff, so keep it coming. All right, let's find some more emails. Uh, how about this one? From Tom, longtime listener in Ottawa, Canada. It says, regarding the mystery meat pizza from Newfoundland, Hope you're well. Just a quick useless tidbit regarding an amusing anecdote you shared from your trip to Newfoundland in 2007. The blobs of mystery meat on your pizza were, beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
an Atlantic Canada phenomenon called Donaire. Donaire. Donaire meat. Yes. <laughs> yes, you picked my brain. Yes, it was. Donaire meat. The Donaire meat. Yes. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> you know, when you see that, it's just like it... It's like it unlocks that, you know, and it's like, yes, the Donair meat, that's what it was. That that was it, Tom. That was it, Donair meat. Uh, yep, spot on. Uh, you continue. Uh, that was a takeout dish that is particularly popular with the post-bar crowd. Donair in itself is quintessentially spiced ground mystery meat, grilled on a vertical rotisserie and thinly shaved, uh, similar to a Turkish Donair, its namesake, and the Greek gyro. The meat is usually served on flatbread as a wrap, but as you unknowingly came to discover, it also may be used as a pizza condiment. While I enjoy the odd denaire, I certainly can empathize with the shock you must have experienced while biting into this blob of foreign mystery meat with the expectation that it would taste remotely like pepperoni. Anyway, I suspect or at least hope it hasn't impacted your day-to-day life in the last 14 years but hope this email brings you closure just the same. Best regards, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Yes, it did provide a sense of closure. Let's um look this up. Donair meat. Oh, did I print? I don't want to. I don't want to print it. No, there we go. Donair meat. Donair meat Canada. Let's go to Google Images. Donair meat. You see, though, this is the thing. When you look at it as, like, the uh, the images, they always make it look... You get the best images of it. And, um... Though even still, there certainly are a few images that make it look questionable. Like, if I'm looking at this right now and I see this blob... Yeah, I wouldn't... I wouldn't really eat some of these. Some of these pictures I wouldn't eat. But some of them, like, I may eat the denaire meat if it's served, like, as a uh, gyro, perhaps. I would also like to know where the thing came from, you know? I mean, if all of a sudden, you know, that annoying neighbor down the street goes missing, and uh, all of a sudden we've got a, a bountiful harvest of denaire meat, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start scratching my head, and, um... I don't think I would partake in the feast that time around. You know, same thing. You know, that's that's not a good joke. That's not right. I shouldn't say it. All right, since I said, you know, since I opened the door, I'll just say it, and whatever happens, happens. I was going to say, you know, if you notice people's, um, you know, pets starting to go missing or something, I wouldn't eat the Donair meat. But if I were able to find out what it really is, that would help at least a little bit. But, all right, here we go, Donaire meat pizzas. See, all the pizzas, though, that have Donaire meat on it look so much better than the one that I got. I mean, like, some of these look actually, they look pretty solid. Um, this one looks pretty good. The pizza that I got, because the, it looks like the Donaire meat on these pizzas, for the most part, is cut into smaller, um, pieces. You know, and it's like in crumbles, or it's like little meatballs or something, which, that's how I would expect a denaire meat pizza. I remember what I got. This pizza, it looked like something that was probably put in the microwave for 20 seconds or something. You know, they take it out to the table, and it was to the point where it was the pizza was limp, you know, there was no bake to it. The cheese would just was just like completely white. You know, when it's like looks like it's undercooked and it's anemic. And you had these giant blobs of the denaire meat, which were like um salami slices. But again, like not a smaller type, like these were giant and they were brown, and this contrast between this criminally undercooked pizza and these giant brown blotches of this mystery meat. 
And then what really did me in was the fact that no one seemed to know what exactly this was. I couldn't eat it, and my memories beyond that are limited. I'm glad at least I know that there's a name to this, and I think they did, I remember hearing that somewhere, but it might not have been there, it might have been at another place. I might have also heard about the Denaire meat, because I remember I went to this one restaurant in Cornerbrook, and now those are, that was pretty good. I remember I had some wings at this place in Cornerbrook. I don't even know what it was called. It was called like Jungle Gyms or something. I don't know the name of it. It was just like some, you know, bar, restaurant place. But that was actually enjoyable. That was good. No mystery meat there. But that's what it was, yes. Well, thank you. A little bit of uh, closure to that, perhaps. So thank you for writing in. Jonathan checks in and says, Do you have a specific pen you like to use? I'd like to send several to you. Uh, I like using this one cross pen that has the refillable, um, you know, gel uh, ink. But you don't need to send me anything. I don't even have a place to send it. And I'm, you know, just keep the pens. Take care of them and use them well. But thank you for your kind offer, Jonathan. Next email comes in from John, who has been here since 2015, but only recently, I guess he's been watching on YouTube since 2015, only recently discovered the podcast. I really enjoy the laid-back content. I wanted to comment on your discussion on the topic of suits. I am a teacher in Florida, and one of the things I have noticed is the lack of suits in the field of education. I can remember growing up that most administration, district-level employees, and high school teachers wore a suit, and I was quite surprised when I entered the field as it is today. To my knowledge, there is only one individual in my district who wears a suit regularly, and it is the superintendent. My hope is that someday suits will make a comeback in education. While most of my peers would not agree, I believe that it has created a more serious environment in the classroom. I am primarily speaking to the area of middle and high school education. As a first grade teacher, I understand that it would be impossible to wear a suit all day at this age level. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to read this. Congrats on 10 years, and here's to 10 more. Thank you, John. I mean, I agree with you. You know, it's... Like, I agree. I think that there are certain environments uh, where formal attire may work better. I think that there is a time and place for serious um, dress. And I do think, and this is just my take, you can disagree if you'd like, but I think like certain jobs, I don't know, I would just expect a teacher to have a degree of formality. It doesn't mean you have to dress to the nines, but I would hope that the teacher would dress nicer than the students that they're teaching. You know, that's just what I'll put it at. Yeah, ideally suits would be great, but it is what it is. I just think that distinction between the teacher and the pupils is important. I remember, you know, in school, like most of the teachers that I remember when I actually started paying attention in high school, all the male teachers pretty much wore a shirt and tie. Um, no jackets, really, but they all wore ties, at least. So all of them would usually wear... You know, like... Like, what was very common, I remember, is they would wear khaki dress pants. And often, like, a, a blue dress shirt. Or a yellow, or like a colored dress shirt. Sometimes a white shirt. And a necktie. Uh, you would see that so often. That's what most of them would wear. I almost call that like a more informal type of shirt and tie. Like, I think if you had someone wearing flat front, uh, khaki, you know, tan khaki pants, a blue dress shirt, and let's say a blue, you know, striped tie or something. And then you also have another individual wearing, let's say, pleated, dark gray, pinstripe suit pants, you know, a white dress shirt, 
and maybe a red tie. Yeah, well, they're both wearing a shirt and tie. I would say that outfit is much more, you know, formal than the other. That's just my take, anyway. I don't know. Um... But there would be a few teachers that would wear that too. Like some of, a lot of them again would wear like khaki pants with a shirt and tie, um, a lot. But there were a number that would wear like suit pants, you know, with uh, a shirt and tie, kind of like a more formal version of it. The administration all wore suits. Um, they all still did. The principal did. The assistant principals did the uh, district superintendents, I mean, they all still wore full suits. But again, you know, that was for New York, which I, I think more people would still wear suits up here than down in Florida. So it is interesting that you know, there's only one person in your district that still wears it pretty much, just the, you know, the head honcho in charge. Yeah, it's interesting. I always associate you know, teachers with, especially, you know, the male teachers, uh, always wearing a shirt and tie, at least. That's just how I always envision it in my mind. Now, college and university professors, I think that's a different story. I think there may still be a number of professors that still wear full suits. I know from the time that I spent at college... It was like anything goes in terms of how the professors dressed, you know? It was literally, they just wore whatever they wanted. Some of whom dressed very formally, and some of whom didn't. Thinking back, like, there is one guy who would wear, like, dress pants and, like, a polo shirt or a button-down shirt tucked in with a uh, sport coat over that, but never a tie. Yeah, there was one professor I remember who would wear, like, khaki pants and a polo shirt tucked in. But then there was another one who dressed very formally, and he would wear a full suit and tie and an overcoat. I remember he would sometimes wear a, uh, like, an old-school tan, double-breasted uh, trench coat, and then he'd have a full suit underneath that. He was older, though, you know, he was probably in his 70s at this point, so kind of old school there, um, where he would wear a long black overcoat with a full suit, and he was very sharp dressed. He would always have a pocket handkerchief, too, and... You know, I just don't think that's something you would almost ever see a teacher these days in, you know, like high school wearing, but I think at university, you know, you would see that it just depends, you know, what, some, some, some will, some won't. But I think I do remember, I remember after class one day, I did compliment him. I told him I thought that, you know, his attire was fantastic, because it was, it was nice. I liked the, you know, he wore the old style suits too, from like the 80s and 90s, which was cool. Thank you again for your email. Continuing on, we have Daniel corresponding. I have been listening to the podcast on YouTube for almost one year now, and this is my first time writing in. In the last episode, you read an email about visual snow. When I heard it, I was really shocked because it described exactly what I've been seeing my whole life without me realizing it was not something everyone experienced. I think that if it wasn't for that email, I would have never known about it. I remember when I was younger and I had trouble sleeping at night, I would kind of entertain myself with visual snow until I'd fall asleep. I think it's really interesting that something like this goes so unnoticed by so many people and that we know so little about this compared to other diseases. And since it's sort of rare, it makes me feel a little bit special. I also read that people with visual snow can also have brain fog, which is when a person is a bit less aware than usual, and can find it difficult to pay attention because their mind is foggy. Well, I've never been diagnosed with it, but I do find it pretty hard to concentrate when I'm watching a tutorial, or when my teacher is explaining something, or when a friend is talking to me about something. Even while listening to the podcast, I quite often have to rewind because I missed a whole topic. It's like my brain goes to sleep and words just stop making sense. I don't know, maybe I'm just dumb. But anyway, thank you for reading, and I hope you have a good evening, morning, or night. 
Thank you, Daniel. And uh, no worries. Look, that's why the rewind button is there by all means. You know, take it in as many times as you need. Brain fog. I know it's something that a lot of folks have to deal with. And yeah, the visual snow, it is interesting that because it's not of severe detriment, you know, to the quality of life, but it's just something that's there and a lot of people don't really know. As I'm recording this right now, you know, I'm looking at a blank wall in front of me beyond the computer screen. And, you know, I see the little, you know, the persistent fuzziness that's there. I don't know how else to describe it. You know, it's like an analog television set not tuned to any sort of station, you know, like snow, static, visual snow. But it doesn't bother me. I don't sit there, oh, make it go away. No, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. But the the visual snow, it's most prevalent, I think, as it is to anyone who deals with it in the low light, you know, when you're trying to go to sleep, etc. That's when you notice it the most. And, um, and that's when I really see it. But it is interesting. And I didn't realize it wasn't normal until I think late might have even been 2020. I didn't realize it. I just thought this is something that everyone deals with. And then I realized, no, it's not. It's just like, you know, with you, you realized, oh my gosh, this isn't normal, I guess. <laughs> I guess for some it is, but for a lot of people, it's not. It's fascinating. And I've had that many times, you know, same thing with the hypnagogic stuff. And, you know, with the, I also deal with depersonalization, uh, derealization, which that's pretty scary stuff. But I have dealt with that in bouts my entire life. Um, it just comes and goes, so it's not like I've always been that way. It just it comes and goes at random, and I had never known for years a word for it until finally I was able to Google it and figure it out that it's depersonalization and derealization, and that is creepy. You know, that's easily one of the creepiest things. I mean, it's creepier than paranoia in a way. Because this literally controls your perception of reality, so to speak. In that, I mean, you know, depersonalization, it's very tough to explain. But it is as though... All right, you ever go on YouTube and you watch a first-person video, for instance? Like, there is some channel that I found a couple weeks ago. I thought it was kind of cool. It was, I forget the name, it was like walking around, and it really was just that. It was some guy with a GoPro strapped to his head and filming himself walking around different towns and areas, um, you know, like you're seeing it through his eyes. And I thought that was a real cool video. You know, you're able to watch him going around these places, going for a walk, and it's like you can vicariously experience these places that maybe I was looking at locations I hadn't been to in years and it was fun watching this guy walk around there and you know see places that see how it's changed etc but as I'm sitting there watching this video obviously I'm sitting here looking at a screen right I'm physically sitting here in this chair and I am watching his reality and observing it through a screen, right? That's not me walking around there. I don't really feel what he feels. I'm just watching him through a screen. Imagine this, that feeling of when you're observing this person walking around first person, and that feeling that you're observing this externally, that's your own life. you feel completely detached and separated, not out of body, but you're completely separated in a sense from yourself, and you feel like you're watching your life on a TV screen, and you still have control of your actions, you can still speak and feel and all of that, but you don't really feel grounded in this world anymore. It's like, I'm sitting here in this chair, watching this guy walking around, 
but that's me walking around. But I feel like I'm just sitting here watching it, but that's actually me. That's, you know, depersonalization, derealization. And I would get that when I was real young. I never knew a name for it. I just, you know, you don't even know how to explain it properly. And I remember looking through some books at one point. There's no, you couldn't find anything about it. But finally, in like 2014, I was finally able to know at least that there's a name for it. And at least understanding what it is helps. The worst thing about depersonalization and derealization, the two go hand in hand. Um, they occur for no reason. There's nothing that really starts it, nothing that really triggers it. And there's nothing that makes it go away. It starts on its own terms, and it ends on its own terms, too. You know, it's... and it's very scary. Eventually you get used to it. But even then, it's just not the same. It takes a whole lot out of life. It really does. I remember in 2014, you know, most of the time it would happen to me in bouts. And it'll last for like 20 minutes or maybe an hour. And then it'll just go away. And it's not like it magically starts and stops. You just start noticing it. And then it gets to a point where eventually things return back to normal. But it's not abrupt. It just kind of fades in and fades out. But I'm fortunate at least that it's usually for shorter times. But in 2014, once it started and it didn't stop for like three weeks, just straight day after day after day, you feel that way when you go to sleep. You feel that way when you wake up. The cycle repeats, and it's scary, you know, because then you start thinking, you know. You have control over your actions, but you don't really feel like you're actually physically there. It's like I could get myself to just <laughs> run into the highway right now, and, you know, that degree of inhibition is just gone. That'd be that, because it's like you're the puppet master, you know, pulling the strings above the puppet, but you're actually that puppet, you know, it's... I know this stuff sounds like I'm on LSD or something, probably, but that's just how it is. But eventually, you know, it went away, but there's nothing that really makes it stop or start. Um, you know, there was one, another experience, again, in like 2016, for like weeks it happened. And then thankfully it's gotten a little bit better, but it still comes and goes at random, and it's just, I realize it's just how my brain is, it's just a part of life, you know, this is just... These are the cards you're dealt. And that's all that there is to it. Yeah, sometimes, though, it's scary. You'll sometimes... I remember when I was going through it in 2016 pretty bad, I was looking up videos on YouTube about people's experiences, and there was one guy who he said, you know, it just started one day at random, and it never stopped, and it's been 20 years this way, and nothing he ever does will ever make it go away, and it's scary. And, you know, then that really, in addition to that, you know, it gets my anxiety going. You make it, you think, what if it never ends? But thankfully it did. But, you know, hey, I just count my blessings that I'm here and I'm doing all right. So. Creepy, though. Can be creepy stuff. All right, we have an email coming in from Ralph. I hope this email finds you well. If you have the time, I would enjoy listening to your thoughts on the recent successful rover landings on Mars by both NASA and the CNSA. As you are aware, on February 18th, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, successfully landed a rover named Perseverance on Mars. Eight days earlier, on February 10th, the China National Space Administration successfully landed their own rover, named Tianwen-1, on Mars as well. You're knowledgeable in regards to antennas, radio waves, and radios. Uh, could you explain how these rovers, which are roughly 146 million miles away, function through the use of radio waves? And one more question, if you have the time. If you're given an hour window... To broadcast on Mars, what would you broadcast? All the best and thanks in advance for sharing your thoughts. So, regarding the communications, and I will say, 
But it is interesting. I listen to China Radio International. I know some people would accuse me as you shouldn't listen to their propaganda, but I, I enjoy tuning into CRI. I listen to all the stations, you know? I just listen to it all, and I uh, make up my own mind. But uh, I was tuned into them, and I remember they had a program about the uh, the landing, so I had... You don't really hear about that over here, though, but I did hear about it on the shortwave. And, of course, the perseverance, you know, you hear about that, too. Now, the thing is, with communications, there are different frequency ranges, you know? You have... Right, you have long wave, you have medium wave, right? You have short wave, then you have VHF, UHF, etc. Short wave communications are not used for anything outer space related at all. They are not used in the least. Because the way that short wave radio works is it requires the ionosphere. It is used because the signal is beamed up into the upper atmosphere, and the radio signal is reflected off of the charged particles in the upper atmosphere, akin to light bouncing off of a mirror, the signal bounces off of that back down to Earth, now at a greater distance, and that's how the shortwave signals propagate so far, but that keeps the signals on Earth. And yes, there are certain frequencies and times of day that you can use that the signal will just beam out to space, you know, when the certain layers of the ionosphere dissipate a bit. I mean, if I were, like, let's say I could fire up a 500 kilowatt transmitter in New York right now at 3 a.m., you know, beam it up at, uh, let's say, 21 megahertz, and that'll probably shoot out into space. It won't there won't be anything for it to really reflect back on because the certain layers of the ionosphere dissipate and recharge, and that's why certain frequencies are better at certain times of the day. You know, the higher frequencies during the day, lower frequencies at night. That's just what it all deals with, but that's just dumbed down. But one thing, I don't know how true this is. I was listening to a broadcast on the shortwave the other night when I was going out for a walk, and um, it was covering scientific matters, but the guy was saying that there's no ionosphere on Mars, so shortwave wouldn't even really work over there. But I don't know how true that is. But maybe Mars doesn't have an ionosphere. I know the atmosphere there is very different than it is. But anyway, the frequencies that are used for the communication of these rovers are UHF, ultra high frequencies at around 400 megahertz. And they have all of these different sophisticated high gain antennas which are used to, you know, pull in these signals. And they're obviously transmitted from Earth, you know, with very, very specialized uh, transmitters at very specific sites, and you know, it's also precisely targeted, so they'll make sure the signal reaches, you know, its intended uh, destination. And again, there are different ways that the signal can reach. Obviously, there's a delay because of the, you know, just the distance, of course. But I know what's sometimes used is along with the rovers. Now, this isn't always the case, but a lot of the time they can be paired with an orbiter. And the orbiter is used you know, for many reasons. It's not exclusively used for this, but sometimes the orbiter has more sophisticated receiving capabilities that it's able to receive the transmission from Earth, and then, because it's at such close range, you know, comparably speaking to the rover, it then kind of boosts and relays the message essentially through a repeater. It repeats the transmission now at a much stronger signal and closer range, uh, you know, to the rover, so the quality and clarity of the transmission is more or less guaranteed. But again, it doesn't always work that way, and I am no rocket scientist. This is just my understanding of it, and I'm not going to pretend like I'm some sort of NASA engineer. 
but you know you always have a delay with the communications it's just it's not instantaneous and that's because in the universe you know things have their limits you know the speed of sound the speed of light etc only so fast things can go at this point that's why yeah would it be great if the communication between earth and mars is instantaneous but it just doesn't work that way and one day you know if this ever happens if humans ever do go to mars and i wager at least we'll put forth an attempt at some point you know what will really happen i don't know but i think we'll certainly try within the next couple decades anyway the communications between you know the astronauts and the folks on mars to earth it'll be minutes of a delay each way and it would be annoying, but that's just something that obviously would have to go into the training psychologically that they'd have to be ready for. That, you know, it would take minutes between each me- each message to uh, come in. It's just something they'd have to prepare for. And uh, I guess eventually they'd get used to it, but that's how it would be. So, interesting. That's why I was reading, I think, about the uh, Perseverance, that by the time... The signal was coming back to Earth that the landing was successful. It had already been, you know, on the Martian surface for like 10 minutes. And uh, it was only at that point that we were receiving the confirmation. Again, just because of the delay in the radio communications. Um, Again, this is all UHF frequencies. It's not like they're, you know broadcasting on 5850 kilohertz trying to compete with uh, VORW on the shortwave or something. (laughs) You know, that's why if I tried to broadcast to Mars, the signal would just probably, it wouldn't even make it there. If it did, I mean, no one's going to try, you know. Could you imagine the exorbitant waste of money this would be if they uh, brought over a shortwave radio onto Mars to see how the reception is over there? (laughs) That's like if I bet if Elon Musk was, like, a real radio geek, he would do something like that. I bet he would. But even if I, like, had a transmitter to Mars, I would, um... You know, the signal probably wouldn't reach any further than the ground wave. And I would just disappear after that. But who knows? I mean, you know, I don't know. If I were, though, disregarding those parameters, let's say we found the suitable frequency for Mars, and I was going to broadcast there right now... I wouldn't expect much of an audience, but I would joke around. I'd probably, I'd just do what I usually do. You know, I'd say hi to anyone listening and, uh, you know, play some music and uh, have a fun time for an hour. It wouldn't be anything too incredible or too serious, but I think that's what I would do. It's funny, though. I mean, I know some of the shortwave broadcasts, you know, some of the traces of the signal do get sent out into space. So, you know, just funny to think that Somewhere out there, my broadcasts are traveling through the cosmos. It's kind of cool to think. This email comes in from Sam in the UK. I wanted to respond with some thoughts on suits in the UK. I am a nuclear robotics researcher at a university over here. In my field, and more broadly in engineering, it is typical to wear suits but without a necktie. I personally really enjoy... I enjoy wearing suits with the necktie uh, to the amusement and admiration of my colleagues. Admiration. Last week, I was fortunate to be able to speak at the Waste Management Symposia conference in Phoenix, Arizona. One thing I noticed on my trip was that suit wearing and neckties felt much more prominent in the U.S. than they are in the U.K. So it was interesting to hear your thoughts on the latest podcast. This year, the conference is happening online, and I have noticed that many continue to wear suits, including neckties, even over the internet. I have even heard many suggest it's nice to once again have an excuse to put on a suit, so I'm hoping suit wearing has a resurgence post-pandemic. Just some thoughts from across the pond. Best regards, Sam. So thank you, Sam, in the UK. I think it's kind of funny that, you know, suit wearing in the UK isn't really as prevalent as it was many decades ago, but it makes me laugh, you know, that some people have this stereotypical view of the UK that, you know, you're going to go there and you're going to see these 
gentlemen walking around with full suits, with a bowler hat, and an umbrella still. And I just, I mean, I bet there's a couple, you know, traditionalists in the UK that still dress that way, but obviously that's not commonplace anymore. And uh, it's funny that some still have that view. It's fascinating, though, that from your observation, and granted in your field, uh, that more folks over here in the United States still wear the traditional suits with the necktie, and that it's almost more casual in the UK than it is in the US. Because I think a lot of people in the US um, have a view that the UK in some ways may be more formal than the US, but that may not necessarily be true. Very interesting. Hopefully uh, it will have a little bit of a resurgence post-pandemic. Hopefully it won't, you know, die off completely, but, you know, I am not hopeful, but I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll linger on, right? Caden is checking in. Hello, John. Hope you're doing well. I wanted to know your opinion on lucid dreams and fever dreams. I know they can be really trippy, especially fever dreams. Another thing I wanted to know your opinion on is cancel culture and your thoughts about it. Love your podcasts. I find them really interesting. Now, I am familiar with lucid dreams and less so, though still somewhat familiar with the concept of fever dreams. Um, you know, I've experienced a fever dream once or twice when I was really sick, but it wasn't like some sort of trippy uh, experience. Now, lucid dreaming, I haven't really had the the pleasure to experience. Um, there was a time when I really wanted to try, but oftentimes when I dream, I forget that I'm dreaming, and I don't come to that realization. A lot of the time, not always, but sometimes my dreams can be so fantastical, it's just like I'm in another world or something, and it's... I just don't have the wherewithal to realize that I'm dreaming, but, you know... Who's to say? Maybe one night I'll realize that I am, and I'll experience the lucid dream. So it's interesting stuff. Certainly it could have its positive experiences and negative, too. You know, dreams, they are a mixed bag, for sure. Uh, cancel culture is one of those things that's a touchy subject. You know, people do... Here's the thing. A lot of people or things sometimes try to get canceled, and sometimes the success is... it's debatable. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. A lot of the time, what I notice with creators online, any success that comes from, let's say, the attempt to cancel someone, is due to the fact that the individual who is, you know, being canceled ends up being the one who relents and says, all right, I'm going to take a break, I'm going to quit, I'm going to stop, I'm going to etc. And that's why, let's say, the action of trying to cancel someone is successful. I think if, for better or for worse, some of the people who are the recipients of trying to be canceled, let's say, all of them would dig their heels in and say, well, you know, you want me to leave, well, make me. I'm not going to do it myself. I'm not going to stop making videos. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to back down. So come here and physically make me. I think the efficacy of getting canceled would be much less. Now, in some cases, maybe that would be for the better. In other cases, that might be for the worse. A lot of the time when I hear about cancel culture, it's spoken of very plainly in black or white terms. You know, cancel culture is good, or cancel culture is evil. And there's no middle ground. It's like you either have to love it or you have to hate it. Well, guess what? The notorious fence-sitter here at the microphone is going to take another unconventional stance. <laughs> the, um, you know, it could be circumstantial. It's like, there are different things. Let's say that there's someone who is a content creator and has 
credible allegations of pedophilia. And it comes out that this person, you know, tried to, you know, forcefully come on to, like, 11-year-old girls in a sexual manner. That is not right. And, you know, I would hope that those abhorrent actions would have consequences. And at the very least, they get cancelled. Hopefully, if anything else, uh, legally speaking, could come of it, that would be great. But if someone does something like that, right, I think there does need to be accountability, and I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with someone who, again, beyond the shadow of a doubt, is responsible for those sorts of things, you know, has to deal with the, the consequences of that. I don't really have a problem with someone getting cancelled for that. You know, same thing, let's say there's a content creator and it comes out credibly with definitive, irrefutable proof that this guy, you know, beats his girlfriend to a pulp and is horribly abusive, right? I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with that individual getting cancelled. But then you start getting into the gray area where I don't necessarily agree with it. If, let's say, someone, you know, 15 years ago, when they were 14 in high school, made an off-color joke, and that was it, and they're a kid, and now, you know, 15 years later, let's cancel them for that, I think that's a bit silly. One problem that I have in terms of the cancel culture, you know, in those circumstances, is you have to look, all right, what are we talking about here? A lot of the time when it's over something very small, I think sometimes, you know, every individual who has a following, certainly they have their supporters, they have their detractors. There's a lot of people out there that hate my guts, and I understand that. I, I, don't, I don't want everyone to just robotically uh, like me. I think it's natural that people don't like me. That's fine. But sometimes I think when it's over something minor, a lot of the detractors pile on and they suddenly act as though they are a moral authority. And a lot of the individuals who try to say, well, the individual needs to stand up to their actions, needs accountability, and needs to, you know, essentially be cancelled... One issue that I have is a lot of folks that do that, again, take the moral high ground, they act that they themselves never did anything bad. So you're telling me all the people that would want this person cancelled for something that they said when they were 14, if an extensive search was done for everything that you did, you're telling me all tens of thousands of you, I wouldn't find anything suspect? Anything? That's when I disagree with it. So, that's why. People can call me a fence-sitter, but that's my own view of it. I think it's circumstantial. A lot of the time, again, I hear on the shortwave that people are either, you know, that cancel culture is terrible, but there's no, there's no room for debate. It's either good or it's bad. And I disagree with that. I think there can be cases where it can be a good thing, but there are cases where it just goes uh, too far. Now, you know, one example that's been used a lot lately that I see, um, especially in right-wing politics, is Dr. Seuss. And they say, well, Dr. Seuss got cancelled, you know? I keep, uh, I keep getting these spam emails all the time. I keep saying, let me, let me find them. I think I keep saying, I get this like five times a day, every day. Happy birthday, Dr. Seuss, you know? I guess that's supposed to rub it in your face, you know? The thing is, with... Yeah, what is this? <laughs> Dr. Seuss and his friends. I get these spam emails like a dozen times a day from that. <laughs> you know, but like I could get a laugh out of that, but understandably, I mean, in society, for better or for worse, the standards of what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, that has changed over time. That's happened, it happens every, constantly. Uh, you know, it's it's fluid. It's not. It's not completely still. Certain views and attitudes and definitions, etc. It always changes. It always has. 
So granted, at this point in time, you know, at least a sizable majority of folks evidently find content in some of Dr. Seuss's work that's offensive. I think what was the subject of criticism here, I think is really the terminology, you know, cancel Dr. Seuss, right? I think that's what a lot of people are poking fun at, because it's like, you know, Dr. Seuss, what does he care about it? He's been dead for decades, you know? I don't think he cares, <laughs> I don't think he cares anymore about um, his books or if they're trying to cancel him or not, so... I think it was just the name of the hashtag that got propagated that I think led to the criticism there, but if it were formatted differently, then perhaps I don't think it would have gotten the criticism that it did. So that's just my take there. Sam writes in, I've been listening to your podcast for about a year, but this is my first time writing in. I'm an EMT in King County, Washington, and listen to your podcast during the 24-hour long shifts we work. I'm really excited and looking forward to buying a shortwave radio. I know you typically suggest the Texun PL660, but I was wondering if you had any recommendations on older, vintage-looking radios that still work well. I'm hoping to use it as a shortwave radio as well as a furniture piece in our home, and really love the wood furniture, um, that used to be common on those radios. Thanks for the great in-depth content you produce. I don't always agree with your opinions on things, but I'm always happy to hear you explain your thought process. So thank you, Sam. And I think that's really respectable of you to say that, and I think that's a fantastic thing to see, you know. We might not always see eye to eye on everything, but you know, we could agree to disagree. You know, like, as for me, I'm always happy to hear different views. That's why, like I was kind of saying earlier, in terms of my media consumption, I just take a bit of everything. I don't only surround myself with views that I agree with. I listen to everything. And I kind of mash it all together. I try to critically think, and uh, then I, I make of it what I do. But one important thing is that you know, I have my views, I have the things I agree and disagree with. I'm willing to hear the views and opinions of folks who vehemently disagree with me. I'm interested in knowing what other people think, and sometimes seeing that can make me re-examine my own views, and sometimes I've realized that I was wrong. Uh, by all means, but I think agreeing to disagree, it's a very, very important thing, and I'm you know, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're still here, even if we don't see eye to eye on everything. Uh, King County, I think that's over in Seattle, isn't it? And I think the signals should reach your way. I actually last week I got some reception reports from the area. I heard from someone in Seattle reporting good reception, and I also heard from someone in Snohomish, Washington, who was also tuned in on the short wave. So the signals should reach you. As a matter of fact, the broadcast on 5850 kilohertz, which is my main uh, frequency to North America, is actually beamed right at Vancouver, Canada, right over there, so you should get a good signal. Now, unfortunately, as for me, I, I agree with you that those vintage, um, older radios they are beautiful because they really were a piece of furniture, especially in the days before television. It was not only the practical source of news, information, and entertainment at the time, but it was also supposed to be a centerpiece of the home. And yes, they did beautifully construct these things, the lovely wood paneling, etc. I don't have a specific recommendation Although there are antique radio forums out there that I think you could easily make an account on. I know the folks in that community are really, really passionate about their radios, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to help someone out who is, you know, just wondering where to start, you know, what to dabble in. Um, so I, I definitely know that there will be folks out there who can help you out with that. It is cool, though, that there still are people, you know, who listen to shortwave on these old radios. 
and some of those are still put to use, you know, it's like, I still get reception reports every now and then on these old radios, like I'm just going through the email right now, like this one, uh, this guy writes in, uh, listening on my 1938 Zenith, and I just looked up the word Zenith because that was one of the biggest um, radio companies at the time, so like you can look up the Zenith radios, and those, you know, Zenith shortwave radio, of course you'll find the Zenith transoceanic, um, but before that, you know, in the 30s, they made some of those beautiful wood radios, too. And, um, you know, again, like this guy listening on 5850 here in Washington State on my Zenith C-S-238 chair side. And um, he sent a picture, you know, he's got this nice comfy chair with this old, you know, wooden, look like looks like it's real nice and restored radio there. Sent a picture of the dial there, tuned in, and uh, is able to just listen right there, you know? it's That's awesome, this radio from the 30s, still tuned in. And then, you know, another, for instance, and I like that some of the folks include a picture of these old radios. This is another one, someone in Connecticut who said, um, Reception is excellent here in south-central Connecticut, listening on a 1937 Zenith console. They usually call these radios... Um, console radios. So that's a good term you can look up. But a uh, 37 Zenith console 8S154. And uh, so the reception is excellent and the sound is so good. Um, my home sounds like a concert hall due to your program. I sent a picture of it, a lovely radio there. And I think you'll find what you're looking for. And again, they will be very knowledgeable people who love discussing radio, and uh, will certainly be more than happy to help you out. Alex in Minnesota, on your latest podcast episode, you talked your dismay of the suit going out of vogue and asked listeners to chime in on the state of the suit in their area. I will say that while I attended college in Minneapolis from 2016 to 19, I did see a fair share of people wearing suits around the Twin Cities, of course, I'm unsure if this was strictly related to work or for style, but I feel as though at least in my area, in that time frame, I've seen a decent amount. I relocated to a smaller town in Minnesota and haven't seen many suits in this particular area, but then again, I really haven't seen much of anyone for the past year, understandably. I was wondering your thoughts on the barrier to entry for suits, that being the cost, Personally, I have been interested in suits, but my tastes are more modern, which makes it difficult to build a wardrobe that I would be interested in wearing on a regular basis. You've spoken on how, uh, since you're interested in the older style of suits, you're lucky enough to pick them out very cheap. Do you believe you still would have adopted uh, this style? Uh, well, let me rephrase that. That was actually my mistake. Do you believe you would have adopted the style you did if that factor hadn't worked out in your favor? There we go. Thanks for reading and for many hours of entertainment from Alex. So thanks, Alex, out there in Minnesota, Twin Cities, and well, now in a different area. Cost, yeah, cost can certainly be prohibitive. Most certainly can be. And you know, it all depends. Like, the Brooks Brothers stuff... I don't like what I see, but even if I did, there's no way I would pay $2,000 for a suit from them. Same thing with Gucci. Now, the thing that I find absurd about Gucci, it's really, I feel like you're getting scammed, but I shouldn't say that. I mean, I like some of the stuff that they do, but I was looking at this one pair of pants that they had, and it was absurd. It was a pair of dress pants, you know, like the stuff that I wear. Wide leg, drapey, pleats, you name it. $2,500 for a pair of pants. I could go to a thrift store right now and buy a pair of pants that looks identical to that for 10 bucks. No one is going to be able to tell the difference at this point that the pants that I'm wearing 
were $2,500 Gucci pants versus $10 thrift store pants. I mean, that's ridiculous. But, no, I mean, well, let's just say, for instance, that the suits that I like, let's just say these older styles, cost a lot more money. Would I still wear this? I still would. But obviously, my wardrobe just wouldn't be as expansive as it is. You know, I think back to when I first started wearing suits. Like, here's a good, here's a good example. When I first started wearing suits, I didn't wear exclusively the old styles from the 90s. I mean, yeah, back in 2010, the cuts of suits you could get off the rack were more traditional than what you find today, but still more modern, of course, than what I wear nowadays. But I was buying stuff that was mainstream at the time. Yeah, it wasn't cheap. No, I wasn't buying $1,000 suits, but you have to remember, I was like 13, 14 years old, so even buying a suit that's like $150 or so, that doesn't come often. And back then, I would probably get a new suit maybe once a year or twice a year, around Christmas time and around birthday, and that's it. So, you know, I would just wear it, but I would still try to build a collection. But here and there, I just wasn't able to go out and freely buy things all the time because I didn't have the money for that. So cost is more prohibitive. I would just have a smaller wardrobe, and I would still be happy with that. Um, But yes, by all means, I would still wear this. I just wouldn't have as many suits. You know, but it's just what I like wearing. It's what makes me happy, so it's what I would continue to wear. But again, yeah, the cost, you know, when it gets in the way of things, um, could certainly be tricky. So thank you, Alex, out there in Minnesota. Good question. I know it's easy for me to say, well, yeah, you know, I go to the thrift store and it's so easy to, you know, buy them cheap, but, you know, that's not true for everyone. A lot of people like the more modern stuff, and that's fine. Uh, and obviously, again, that is an issue. <laughs> this is interesting that it's a question about a topic we just discussed. Uh, Benjamin in Rome, Italy. On the latest podcast, you read an email about weird dreams, and that reminded me about lucid dreaming. Last year, I was really into it, read about it online, watched videos, and attempted various times to go lucid, but with poor results. Something that kind of scared me was the fear that If I had learned how to lucid dream, I would have lived the rest of my life constantly having to check if I'm dreaming or not, not being able to tell reality from imagination. What do you think about it? Have you ever had a lucid dream? Thanks for taking the time to read this email. Hopefully my English isn't too bad. Have a nice day, night, and keep it up, Benjamin. Uh, Thank you, Benjamin. No, your English is great. Perfectly understandable, so whatever it is that you're doing, keep doing it, because you're, you're doing great. Uh, as for lucid dreaming, like I said previously, I've never lucid dreamed. You know, I tried here and there, but I never was able to. So my results, lackluster and nothing to brag about, nothing to, um, nothing to talk about either. But I guess there's a technique to it. Maybe it just works better for certain people, you know, than it does for others. I don't know. Like, I wonder if some people are more predisposed to lucid dreaming than others, and I don't know. It's, a, it's something that I have no clue. We have a short question from John in Illinois. If anyone would happen to run into you in public, waiting in line at a store, for instance, do you have a preferred way that people approach you? Perhaps a handshake, a simple wave, and or nod? Or do you prefer no interaction at all? I can imagine that you've encountered this situation in the past, and I'm curious how you've handled it. Regards, John in Illinois. Thank you, John. Um, well, I mean, you could approach me any way you would like. You're free to do so. I guess if I had any preference, it would just be nice not to cause a scene. By that, I mean, don't... You know, if it's like a real, let's say I'm in a bookstore or something and it's real quiet, 
you see me, and then at the top of your lungs, you say, holy, you know, then the S word, of course, review, brah, right? I, I wouldn't, I mean, I'll still, I'm not going to think any less of you, um, but I would certainly prefer that it would be more, you know, orderly and civil than that. Just, I mean, just approach me. Just come up and say, always ask the question first. Um, if you see me and you want to say anything, just say, you know, hi, or, you know, excuse me, are you the report of the week? You know, are you review bra? Something to just make sure I am, you know, who you think I am. Because there have been times where I guess there's people out there that look like me, that's not me. Like, there was one guy I remember who was saying, Oh, dude, you know, I swear to God I saw you at the Taco Bell, you know, in, um, somewhere in Missouri. I swear that was you. What were you doing over in my town? I saw you with the suit. I was going to come up to you, but I didn't. Here I was sitting in Florida, not in Missouri at all. I uh, was thinking, no, that was not me. That was just someone that looked like me. Um, so always just, shoot the question first and make sure you're talking to the real me because it may happen that it's someone that looks like me but isn't so before you go in for like a picture or anything just make sure it's really me and um you know, say hey is this you know report of the week is this review bra you, you, you the dude that does the food reviews um you could say uh, do the, the vorw you know just something and um Providing it is me, I'll say, yeah, that's me. You know, I'll probably say that word for it. I'll say, yeah, that's me. And um, then if you certainly don't initiate it, I'll certainly um, say, would you like to take a picture or something? And more than happy to. So, you know, that's all that it comes down to. But I would, here's the thing. I would much, much, much rather just come up to me, flat out ask, are you the report of the week? You know, I just wanted to say hi, or you could say, um, I wanted to get a picture, whatever. Flat out, just, look, just come right up to me and just ask it. I mean, just shoot. That's what I actually encourage you to do. What I don't like are the folks who sit there and take a picture of me without ever coming up to me or saying anything. I find that creepy and disrespectful. Um, my view of that has soured over the years more than I already disliked it. Um, I wasn't a fan of it in 2017, but even more so now. I have eyes. I have eyes. I observe my surroundings. I know sometimes people, they think that, oh, I'm just, uh, look at me, I've got my phone here just at this very strange angle. You know, I'm just trying to get this selfie, but I keep trying to get you in the shot. Oh, yeah, nothing strange about that. Please just come up to me and just, just ask. And if you even want, as strange as this would sound, I would actually have tremendous respect for you if you came up to me and said, number one, I'd, could I get a picture? Number two, would you mind if I get a creep shot of you? I'll say, you know... That's strange, but all right, fine, go for it. If I'm comfortable with that, I'll tell you, yeah, go for it. And if you want to pretend like you're sitting there and, you know, getting a picture of me in the wild or something without me noticing, I don't care. You know, I'll pretend to look at something and, you know, yeah, I don't care. I'll work with you. <laughs> I'm flexible that way. I don't have a problem spending a couple minutes, um, you know, with someone who, who recognizes me and you want a picture or something, you know. It all depends. I can't say I'll do that every day or something, but I, I'm just trying to say I'm easygoing. I don't bite. I'm not going to, you know, sit there and scream at you because you recognized me or something. So that's all. But most importantly, make sure you're talking to the right and real um, me. You know, don't just, if it's a, some stranger, I would feel bad for them if someone's taking pictures of them and you know, they're just on their lunch break and they're wondering what's going on, you know. So just do do the right thing and just make sure it's really me. That's all that I ask. Otherwise, like I've established, I'm easy going. I don't bite. I'm not going to harm a fly. Just come up and just say hi. I don't mind. All right, let's get into uh, another email. And then I'm going to take a break. Obviously, you won't notice. It'll just be a cut. 
Um, but it's getting a bit late here, and I'm just going to try to wind down. Let's uh, go over to this one. This is a good email to wind down with. Uh, from Ryan over in Utah. In your last podcast, you asked about suit-wearing trends in other parts of the world. Here in Utah, even during COVID, it isn't unusual to see men wearing suits during the workday. Utah is a very religious state, and much of the culture values good grooming and menswear uh, during the week, as well as on Sundays. White-collar professionals in all sorts of fields wear suits regularly, and facial hair is very uncommon. It's a very cultural phenomenon that caught my eye when I moved here, as I'm not from here and hadn't been in this cultural environment all that much. I suspect that suits will be common here, even after they've faded even further from New York. Best regards, Ryan in Utah. So thanks, Ryan. Yeah, the uh, Latter-day Saints, you know, the uh, the Mormons over in Utah. Very, very well-dressed and well-groomed indeed. So that doesn't surprise me that out there in Utah, um, you know, suits still still hold on, I suppose. And I imagine they will, for again, for a while, maybe longer than they will in other areas in regards to their prevalence. Like, I think already what you're seeing now is an example of that. You know, just seeing more out there than you would elsewhere. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, holding out, so to speak. There were times, I remember, where I have been asked if I was, you know, a Mormon. I mean, I get asked that all the time in the YouTube comments. But I remember once I was... Um, and again, I was pretty young, but I was out in Wyoming... This was in 2011 when I was going to Yellowstone. And uh, as we were going there, we stopped in the middle of the state to uh, get a bite to eat. And there was a McDonald's, you know, because even in the middle of Wyoming, in such a, uh, you know, a desolate state, you will find a McDonald's. Those places are everywhere. And, of course, there was a McDonald's. So you go in and got a bite to eat. And I was standing there online, I remember that day, strange that I committed this to memory, but I guess it was just because it dealt with my attire. I remember that day, you know, it was warm, it was like in July, and it gets hot out there in Wyoming. I mean, it's much cooler in parts of uh, Yellowstone, but like in the middle of the state, it can get scorching hot. But I was wearing these, um, you know, gray suit pants, and I had a white dress shirt that was short-sleeved and a red tie. Funny that I remember that a decade later. And I was standing there online, and sure enough, there was this one lady who flat-up asked. She said, oh, you know, I think I know y'all. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're missionaries, aren't you? And uh, I was just thinking, oh, this is going to be an interesting one to explain. And, you know, it wasn't, didn't cause any issues or anything, but... Obviously was, you know, I was thought to be a, uh, probably a Mormon missionary. I, um, and that's happened to me before. I remember once I was on the Amtrak train, and I was sitting in the cafe car at the table. I think I was doing some reading or something. And the train was going through South Carolina, and sure enough, there was someone who was looking at me saying, Oh, you're, uh, you're the pastor of, uh, you know, such and such church, aren't you? I was thinking to myself, oh, no, I'm not. I, you must have me confused with someone else. I apologize. And, you know, such things. So I do get sometimes um, confused, you know, as a, a member of, let's say, a religious uh, organization or, you know, as a pastor or a missionary or something. It's just kind of funny, but, you know, it is understandable. In, in those circles, you know, this means of dress is much more commonplace. Thank you for your email. All right, with that, everyone, I'm going to uh, get some rest. I'll be back, you know, immediately with the magic of editing, but I'm going to get some sleep, and then we'll be back to answer some more emails. You're listening in to VORW, Radio International. Any feedback is welcome at VORWINFO at gmail.com. Again, that's VORWINFO at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you email comes in from anonymous 
First of all, congratulations on reaching 10 years of content creation. It takes a courageous person to put themselves in the public eye knowing they'll face unfair criticism and mocking, so I applaud you, sir. I found you about two months ago when YouTube suggested one of your videos where you reply to mean comments, and I really liked how you played along instead of taking them personally. I then found your review videos, which I binge-watched. I find it funny and a bit frustrating how you always say, I'm going to get right into the point, and then you proceed to stall for several minutes, going on about nothing much. I've since found your podcast, and I like hearing you talk about random topics. I listen while uh, I'm working, since your voice helps relax me. I do tend to disagree with some of your views, like how you think New Year's resolutions are a waste of time, but that's not the topic I wanted to discuss. To interject, you're more than welcome to uh, not see eye to eye with everything. We agree to disagree. That's a view that I try to really put into practice. I think it's something the the world needs some more of, and no, that's that's fine by me. We don't we don't have to agree on everything to get along. Still, you know, that's how it can be. Anyway. Uh, continuing with your email, I want your thoughts and opinions on this situation I'm in. To set the stage, I do not have many friends. It's hard for me to make and keep friends because I have a strong personality that can be off-putting. I treasure the friends that stick around because I know they honestly care. But anyway, I recently had a falling out with one of them, and we'll call him Robert. A little bit on Robert is that he's a physically small guy who likes to run his mouth. Robert had invited me and a mutual friend over to his place to hang out. We played some video games and drank beer like we usually would. As the night went on and drinking and more drinking was involved, Robert started picking on me. His light-hearted jokes turned into personal attacks under the guise of, I'm just messing with you, bro. I tried to be cool about it until he brought up my girlfriend, which he knew was a no-no for me. He knowingly crossed that line, and I just lost it. Maybe it was me just being sick of him at that point, or maybe it was the hard liquor in me, but I practically assaulted him. I did that thing that bullies do in the cartoons, where they grab someone by their shirt and pin them against the wall. He looked terrified of me and kept apologizing as I cussed him out and even punched him. He didn't fight back, so I just threw him on the ground and went home. I felt and still feel horrible for the way I acted that night. He might have crossed a line by making fun of my girl, but I crossed an even bigger line by putting my hands on him. I feel really bad about not controlling my anger. I could have just walked away from the situation, but I made it so much worse. I went over the next day to clear the air, which is not easy for me because I was so embarrassed and, as a prideful person, it was hard for me to admit I was wrong. He didn't want to talk and he said he wasn't ready. I later found out he had been physically abused as a child and our altercation had brought up all that emotional trauma. So I wanted to know what you think about the situation from the outside looking in. Was I justified? How would you have handled that situation if you were in my shoes? And do you think him and I can still be friends? If so, how? Anyway, I would love to hear back from you. Thanks for reading and everything that you do. Sincerely, Anonymous. Thank you, Anonymous, for your question. Obviously a serious one, but certainly one which I would be more than happy to at least impart my thoughts on. Now, like I was saying earlier in the email, and this ties into it, you don't have to agree with everything that I I say. I am not a professional. I am not a counselor. I am not, you know, I think you know how it is. You're just asking a question. You want some extra opinions on this. So, you know, that's all that it is. I'm just giving my two cents. Now, all right, it's a tough situation in the to the extent where alcohol is involved in the last show that I did I think it I get so I lose track of this stuff maybe it was two shows ago now I was talking about alcohol when I was you know 
expressing my own frustrations with it and why I am not a drinker, you know, and one of the things that I don't like about alcohol, I never did, is the decrease in inhibition. Now, I know sometimes that can, you know, they do call it liquid courage for a reason, but evidently it allows for situations that could be resolved much more easily and peacefully to sometimes spiral out of control. Now, I know you mentioned that you practically assaulted him, and I don't mean to, you know, I don't have a bone to pick with you, but I think you did assault him. Uh, You know, now the, the, the definition of assault does vary, you know. Some people would even say that just by, you know, grabbing him and pushing him against the wall and, uh, by the shirt collar, some would call that assault, you know, you could say that was roughing him up, but the punch, when I when I read that you punched him, that is definitely uh, assault. Now, the one thing, at least you didn't keep, you didn't beat him to a pulp or anything. He didn't fight back, but that's aside the point. He crossed the line, right, in terms of his verbal attacks against you and those close to you. But, you know, you you do speak the truth. You crossed a bigger line in regards to your reaction. Now, I know, again, in the heat of the moment, you guys are drunk, inhibition, judgment, decision-making is impaired. You know, (laughs) alcohol, and sometimes it does have a reputation for, you know, people who are inebriated getting into a fight. But I don't want to make excuses. I think we have to realize that what was done that evening from all parties involved was wrong. You are in the wrong, I think more so than your friend. And I think it's because escalating it from simple verbal back and forth to you know, physically grabbing and punching him, that's a huge step. And, you know, it kind of brought back perhaps that, you know, maybe triggered some PTSD or something that he might have had, but you didn't know that at the time. So to answer your question, I'll answer them in order. Were you justified? I don't believe so. How would I have handled the situation if I were in your shoes? Now, the one thing is that you have to, and I, you get this, you know it, I'm a different person, and the way that I handle things is going to be very different than you do, and it might not make sense. I would, I would have walked away. I am not a confrontational person in terms of, you know, physical aggression, or even verbal. There was a time where I was a little feistier, than I am now, but those days are long gone. If I was there and, you know, having a couple drinks and this guy who is a friend of mine is, you know, starting to, is obviously being demeaning, I would have walked away. At first, it depends on how bad it would get, but if I started to notice that, you know, the room was uh, starting, you know, that it was starting to sour, the situation is what I'm trying to say, and things were starting to get nasty, I think the first thing I would do is try to change the topic, try to just say, you know, it's, can we just talk about this, can we talk about that, etc., and in a non, you know, I don't want to escalate the situation, in a non-aggressive way, try to tell them, look, I just, I don't want to go here tonight. I just don't want to do this. Can we can we talk about or do something different? You know, can we just focus on the video game or whatever we're playing? Assuming that doesn't work, I would have... That would be it. I'd be done. I'd say, well, you know, listen, I'm, I'm just not feeling this tonight. I'm, I'm going to leave now. And that would be that. And if it got to the point where, again, it just really hurts, he crossed that line, I wouldn't say right there in person that this friendship is done, but I would leave, 
and either let him know once he's not drunk anymore, or it could be the point where I would just be done with him, never talk to him again. That's what I would have done. I would never have handled it the way that you did. You know, mistakes were made. Uh, do you think that you and him can still be friends? I, that's the thing. I don't know. I'll tell it to you this way. If I were in his shoes... So again, everyone here did things wrong. I was drunk. I was being stupid. I was running my mouth. I was saying these things. But it got... But it got to the point where someone who I had considered a friend, you know, did that, I would not be friends with this person anymore. I don't know what sort of dynamic you guys have, but to me it's at the point where it, it doesn't seem salvageable to me. You know, I just feel like true friends don't physically fight each other. Now, maybe my own view is skewed. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned or something. Maybe that's something that friends do. I don't know. I Look, <laughs> I am so solitary, I don't really, uh, you know, I'm not a social person. But this is just, this is just what my gut is telling me. If it can be mended, that's something that you will only know in terms of the dynamic, in terms of how far you guys go back, how you get along, etc. But to me, I, I wouldn't. I think it's over. I think it's done. And let that be that. Evidently, there may have been some bad blood in the past to kind of start you know, leading on to those remarks, and judging by your email, you said he runs his mouth, so it doesn't seem like this was a one-off thing. Personally, I think it's done. You know, I'd be done with it, because it's, it's one of those memories that was created there that I don't think anyone's going to forget anytime soon. So, I would just say... Let it be, let it... If it's over, it's over. Sometimes it's time to go your separate ways. What I would also recommend is trying to examine the situation. You know, you just gotta realize that... All right, that doesn't mean... Obviously, if someone starts fighting you, fight back. But... Otherwise, try to look, if things get heated again, doesn't need to be with this guy, but with anyone. Try to, um, you know, just distance yourself, walk away, you know, because here's the thing. Think about it this way. I know that evening, when that happened, you know, it might have felt, you know, you were putting him in his place, you were telling him what for, you know, that's what he gets for talking about my girlfriend this way. But look at all the trouble that that act has caused subsequently. Number one, what was done wasn't right, should never have happened. Number two, and I know this might sound selfish, but it's just something you gotta think about. Look at the whole storm that this brewed. Was that worth it? Is this something that you wanted to go through? Is this something you'd want to go through again? I doubt it. So please be mindful of your actions. I just don't think it's right to do those sorts of things, but that's just my take. You can disagree. As I said, you have every right to, but this is just merely my opinion. Now let's continue on with a number of emails. We will try to get to as many as we can, and then that will be it for the program. Again, you could always reach me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. Once again, that's v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. 
This next email comes in from Ruby. It's 3 a.m. and I'm all snuggled in bed and trying to sleep, and YouTube recommended me a video of yours, so I clicked because your suit in the thumbnail looked really nice, the blue pinstripe suit in the Wendy's breakfast video. I was looking at your hands and it hit me, are you left-handed or ambidextrous? You seem to use both well in the video. Many people compliment your hands in the comments, so I'll just add to the top of that stack right there, but they are very nice and even steal the show sometimes. I hope you feel the same way about them because they deserve it. Before I drift off, I had an actual question for the podcast, maybe. You say a lot you are introverted and like your time alone, and you don't enjoy socializing very much. Do you think you would feel differently about that if you did not receive fan emails and such? What about if there was no internet? Do you think you would get rather lonely and maybe socialize more? From Ruby, thank you for your email and for your kind words as well. And I appreciate your listenership to the radio broadcasts likewise. So first and foremost, into your questions about the hands, I am not left-handed, and I do not believe that I am ambidextrous as well, although you aren't the first person um, to potentially surmise that I may be. I don't believe that I am. Oh, here's an interesting thing. I can only write with my right hand. So in terms of writing, I am right-handed. And I feel as though I can move my right hand about with more dexterity than I can my left hand. One interesting thing, though, that my left hand is, I would say, superior to my right hand is when I am trying to carry things. For instance, looking at the table right here, I'm looking at a few small objects, let's say just a few little... Well, here, I have a few bottles here of some vitamins that I was taking. And, you know, just short little bottles. If I were told to pick these bottles up, with my right hand I might be able to pick up two of them. And if I tried any more, I would struggle, and it would be difficult, and I would probably drop a few. However, with my left hand, because there's five right there, I would be able to easily grab all five with my left hand, be able to position them perhaps in such a way between even my fingers. It might look silly, it might look weird, um, but I would certainly be able to carry more with my left hand than I ever could my right. And it's just interesting that I feel as though when I am carrying things, especially smaller objects, I can carry many more in my left hand, and I feel as though I can, again, uh, do so more efficiently than my right. So that's just interesting, but aside from that, uh, that's as far as it goes in terms of my hands. Uh, thank you again, though, for your kind words uh, about the hands. I really don't think of them that much. To me, they are just hands and nothing more. Um, more often than not, a lot of people say some very nasty things about my fingernails, so evidently I keep them very clean. I just like to keep them longer, but uh, thank you for your kind words again. Now, as for your additional question in regards to the uh, socializing aspect, I don't think that I would feel any differently if I didn't receive any comments or emails. And I say that because, number one, I think back to how I was before, you know, the YouTube channel ever really got big. And I even think back, you know, to when I was in school before I ever had a YouTube channel. And I was a loner back then. You know, I was just not a, a social person. I just wasn't a, uh, a person that, you know, constantly needed to be around others. Now, that doesn't mean that I hate everyone, but... Obviously, I am just very introverted, and that's all that it comes down to. I remember when I was really young, I was already introverted, and at that point, you know, it's... I don't know how normal it is for a young child to be introverted, so they thought something was wrong with me. 
but, you know, that's for another day. Evidently, I've made it this far regardless. Um, but I've always just preferred not to really be in the action and have tons of people, you know, tons of friends and any of that stuff. Uh, I'm just a solitary person. I have been my entire life, and that's just how I am. Thank you for your question, Ruby. We next hear from Derek, writing, I have been listening to your show for a while, and I love the wide-ranging topics that you cover. Thanks for all the efforts, including reading this email. I apologize for the random topics of the message below, but hey, the show is called Random Talk. To interject, no, no need to apologize. That's actually what I encourage. So this is, the, you're just doing exactly what I ask of, of listeners. So nothing to apologize for. You're doing nothing wrong. Your questions. I'm writing to you from Wisconsin. Have you ever been to the state? So let's see. I may have been to the state of Wisconsin, but I actually need to consult a map. Some may find it disappointing, though, when you hear. Let's see. Yes, I have indeed been to Wisconsin. The, for those of you who are in Wisconsin, though, I don't even think I ever even... I drove through the state in 2011. I don't think I even stopped and got out of the car once. The same goes for Minnesota. I remember, and this is in conjunction with the one trip um, that I referenced earlier when I was in Wyoming. This is on the way back, but we drove from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, all the way to Chicago, Illinois, in one day, and it was just a straight shot. We drove through Minnesota on Interstate 90, and I remember there we didn't even stop once. We just drove straight through the state. And the same applied for the state of Wisconsin. Driving through on Interstate 90, not stopping anywhere. So, I, I suppose I can say, yes, I was physically in Wisconsin. Although it really wasn't much of a visit. More so, I was simply traveling through at a rather high rate of speed. The same goes for the state of Minnesota. So yes, while I can say I've been in both of those states, I can't really say that I was there to really, you know, experience the state. I was just passing through. Continuing with your email, the second question, do you have a preferred podcast platform? I've heard that some give better listener data than others. I think the podcast industry growth and in particular, Spotify's expansion is really interesting. I listen to the show on Spotify. Though the only podcast platform, I really don't care what anyone listens to this show via, uh, the only podcast platform that I make any sort of money from is YouTube. Nothing else is monetized. So I don't make a single cent from any platform except for YouTube. And oftentimes, the broadcasts on YouTube are demonetized either in part or in full because of the topics that I discuss. So that's why at the beginning of the broadcast, I make the short little announcement regarding donations or advertising. A lot of people, they, <laughs> you should see some people, they send these real vulgar messages because of that. Um, but I wish people just understood why I say that. You're not forced to do anything, um, but that's the reason why that announcement is made. So it's a shame it gets on so many people's nerves, um, but in the end, when it comes down to these platforms, listen on whatever platform is most convenient to you. On occasion, the shows that go out on YouTube, I have to trim a few things out, not because of monetization, but some discussions may just involve the account being permanently banned because I already had a few strikes against the account. So some of the subject matter is occasionally edited out of the YouTube airings. But if you listen on any other platform, 
you are getting the full experience. So listen on whatever platform you find most convenient. I know the program is available on a wide variety of platforms. I know it goes out on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Amazon Music, I think it's called, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, AM Radio, and more. Uh, So you could certainly listen in a wide variety of ways, and simply listen via whichever platform offers you the smoothest listening experience and the most convenience. And finally, you say, as a postscript, Review Bra, could you say hi to my girlfriend Kate? We love your YouTube channel, and she especially loves the Popeyes reviews. So hello to Kate. (laughs) And you also have PPS. What is your opinion on Panda Express? Do you have a favorite menu item? Panda Express is all right. Uh, Granted, I always call it Americanized Asian cuisine. Um, But some things certainly are all right. When I go to Panda Express, I often get, and it's been a while, but I often get the orange chicken and the fried rice. And if available, and this is like very rare when it happens, but on occasion, I will get the chicken pot sticker. You know, there was a time when I really did like, well, my mind is blanking out on me. I don't even know the, uh, the honey, honey sesame wasn't shrimp, was it? It was chicken. Boy, I had one of those moments where I just forgot what I was, what the name of this item was. But that thing is really hit or miss. Uh, there have been times where it's been really good and times where it's been eh, not the best. And that only comes around, I think, a few times, you know, every now and then. So that's what it all comes down to. Thanks again for your email. Next, we hear from Phil in Ohio saying, I recently started listening to the podcast on Spotify a couple months ago while at work, and I've tuned into the show ever since, or I've tuned into every show since. Congrats on a decade on YouTube. Thanks to the years of amazing content, and here's to many more. I have two questions for you that I'd love, to s- I'd love for you to see and perhaps respond to on your podcast. One is just a general question about the evolution of your channel, and the other is a little deeper. So I occasionally rewatch some of your older videos from 2016 to 2017, and I couldn't help but notice that your style and personality have changed quite a bit. Back then, your show was slightly chaotic, lots of dry humor, and it seemed you were really hamming it up for the camera. Compare that to now, and it's night and day. You're much more professional, and the chaos is few and far between. What prompted this change of style and delivery? Did you get tired of that style of reviews, or was it an unintentional progression? So to answer the first question, no, there was no uh, there was no real change. It was an unintentional progression. I think I've just kind of ran out of energy in that regard, and... Um, you know, it's just something that changes with time. It changes with age. And uh, that's all that there is to it. I am a very, very subdued person. And I think I've only gotten more so with time. So it's just a natural progression. And that's what we have there. I think when I did the reviews back in 2016, I think I was a bit louder than I am now. And that's just how I was then, and this is just how I am now. You know, it's just the natural change of things. We all change, sometimes more so than others, and that's just one of the ways that I've changed over the years. Your second question, you say, is simple, but something that I've been struggling with for a while. How do you motivate yourself day to day? I've unfortunately settled into a sedentary lifestyle, and I can't seem to break free of it. I tend to just go to work, come home, and either play video games or sleep until my next shift. Occasionally, I'll talk to my friends and play games with them, but that's the only activity I'll do to break up the monotony. Any advice on how to motivate yourself? Thanks for listening to my questions, Mr. Review Bra. Thank you, Phil, in Ohio, for writing in. Well, that's difficult. Reason being is because I 
deal with the very same thing sometimes. Uh, there have been occasions where I will just fall into the same routine day after day after day, and it's tough to break. So that's, that's, I get it. Now, the one thing that's difficult with me is there's really, how do we even want to say this? I guess I'm all right, you know, being in this sort of routine, so to speak. It doesn't really bother me. Well, when it comes down to trying to find the motivation to try to, let's say, break from the norm, try to do things that, you know, you don't necessarily do, you know, there are different... One thing that can certainly help is try to pinpoint the root cause of it. You know, what is the issue, or why do you think the issue uh, comes about in regards to this routine and, you know, not being able to break from it? Is it the fact that you really don't know what you want to do? Is it the fact that you know what you want to do, but you don't have the time to do it? That's something that faces a lot of people. Do you not have the financial resources? Or could it be that you have the resources, the ideas, but it's just tough to deviate from what it is that you normally do, and, well, let's face it, there's no harm in saying it, but sometimes laziness prevails. And, you know, well, I'd, much as I want to do this, I'd rather just kind of hang out here and, you know, <laughs> have a good nap, for instance, right? What might it be? So just try to examine your situation and see, well, what might be getting in the way of this? Then one day, and this is, this is the toughest part, just trying to make that initial move. And maybe try to plan it out. It's something, even if it's something very simple, you know, whatever it might be, trying to just do something new if you want to. It can be something as simple as just saying, all right, well, how about instead of watching television and then going to sleep, I want to go and explore this park, for instance, you know, and get some fresh air and just see what there is to see. One thing that you could do even for an activity as simple as that, I would say there's one of two things you could do. Number one, if you feel a burst of spontaneity and you have the motivation and energy to do it all of a sudden, just go out and do it then and make of it what you will. And if you don't, Try to plan it out in advance, even a week in advance if you want. You could say, well, how about this? Thursday, you know, at 6 p.m., instead of doing this, I'm going to try to do this instead. Plan around it, you know, and then go do it. You have advanced warning. You can prepare yourself mentally and in some cases physically. Then enact that plan. And once it's done, providing that it was an enjoyable experience, think about how much fun it was to do what it is that you did. And think, well, you know what? This, isn't need this doesn't need to be something that I have to do every day. But think about how much fun it was, how enjoyable it is. Think about the fact that you can do it again. And now use that feeling, that positive feeling, as the primary driving force to doing these sorts of things. Say, well, you know, I know it's a lot of fun. I have this living proof that it was. How about I try to repeat this experience? You know, how about I try to do... This is just a little strategy that you can try to employ. I'm not going to say that it works like a charm, but this is something that you could do. So I wish you the very best, and I'm sorry I don't have a better, a better answer for you. This next email comes in from Mikey. Now, the name is spelled M-I-C-K-E-Y, but I actually have an unwritten rule, especially if anyone writes me, I will never pronounce that name as Mickey unless the sender explicitly implies that that is how it is to be pronounced. Otherwise, even if it's blatantly wrong, that name is always pronounced Mikey to me due to the fact that once, back in 2014, I remember I pronounced someone's name as Mickey, and the fury, and it lasted for years, and it's something I never want to experience again, so that name is always Mikey to me, and just let me know if I got it wrong. But you say, I have a question for the VORW YouTube broadcasts. 
Have you ever had to take care of a stray pet or adopted a stray animal before? I'm an RA for my university, which basically means I log in mail and let people into their apartments who get locked out. But on occasion, I have to take care of runaway animals, and I was wondering if you had any guidance slash experience with taking care of pets that aren't yours. So thank you for your question. Unfortunately, I just have to give a short but honest no to that. I don't have any experience taking care of uh, stray animals, and it would be irresponsible of me to try to offer advice. I always feel that having a pet, especially, you know, a dog or a cat or a larger animal, but even the small ones too, that is a living, breathing organism, well, they require time, they require dedication, they require energy and full commitment. And unfortunately, at this moment, that's just something that I don't know if I would be prepared to give. So as a result, I just feel like it would only be right for me not to have any pets if I have my doubts as to the amount of energy I could put forth in properly raising it. So that's why I don't have any pets, and I, I can't give any advice in regards to that. So I'm sorry, I know it. this isn't a very helpful answer, but I would rather just tell it to you straight than try to Google something and, you know, try to act like I'm some sort of uh, you know, animal caretaking expert, which I am not. So I apologize, but I wish you the best of luck in your uh, animal endeavors. We next hear from Tyler writing, After hearing your show regarding the Myanmar coup, I did more of my own research on the topic and discovered that apparently the U.S. has indeed imposed sanctions upon Myanmar and has also worked with China to potentially assist in stopping the coup. Would love to hear your take on these segments. Thanks again for the awesome show. So, this article was from CNBC, and it was from March 4th. Now, I just have my doubts on the efficacy of these sanctions and the cooperation geopolitically because look at the current situation in Myanmar. The military is digging their heels in only further. I don't know how many people are getting killed by the day, but I'm sure it's much larger than whatever it is that you're seeing on whatever videos manage to even get out of the country. You still have communication blackouts, martial law, etc. So it doesn't seem as though this has really done anything, and I don't think anyone is going to do anything. I think that unless the resistance were to come from within, unfortunately, as pessimistic as it is, I think that this is the new government of Myanmar. You have this gem from UN News, Myanmar. UN Rights Office, <laughs> deeply disturbed, unquote, over intensifying violence against protesters. Well, at least we can all sleep soundly tonight knowing that the UN has expressed their deep concern. I shouldn't poke fun at that, but I hear that phrase so often that it's become a bit of a meme geopolitically speaking, because it's a, such a trend, and I've noticed this since 2014 when I first started paying attention, that whenever horrific things go on around the world, no one really does anything about it but the UN, where some, usually European, though sometimes North American power, always says that they have expressed their deep concern. And that's just the way of kind of making it look like you care and you're passing the buck on to someone else. And uh, that phrase always gets me. It's like, it's like clockwork, you know, if something happens, you're bound to hear those two words time and again. Sadly, the horrific tragedies in Myanmar being no exemption. This next email comes in from Rennie in East Tennessee. My wife and I have been viewers and listeners for at least six months, 
and we really enjoy your content. We are currently on our way to Panama City, Florida, and catching up on the podcasts in the meantime, she's driving. I am currently majoring in music composition, which I tend to be pretty good at, but I have been struggling with keeping my passion for it burning. Because of this, I have decided to put my education on hold and join the army at the end of the semester. While in school, I compose when I can, but I don't often get the time. Ironically, when I'm on breaks, such as winter break, summer break, and the recent COVID quarantine break, when I have a lot more time to write, I never feel the desire. In the odd case that I do, I always have writer's block. The majority of my classes are music-related, so I feel like that has some form of propaganda effect. It also makes it feel more like work than fun, so my breaks are free of composition as well. With music being such a difficult field to find a career in, especially since I don't really want to be a high school band director, I find this dying flame to bode very unwell for my future. Upon my research of careers in the military, I have determined that it would probably be the best financial stability I could get. I imagine it would also help me grow as a person. In addition, maybe a passion for music could return, and I could pursue it as a hobby. I feel like my content would be even better without poverty breathing down my neck. Many people who major in music are stuck with unrelated jobs that they don't want until they find a music job, so I think it makes sense either way to get a good career in the military that I do enjoy and mix music with it. This is a very big decision for me, and I've yet to tell many people. A large part of the decision is based on where I want to be financially, but the other part of my motivation lies in finding purpose and making a change in the world. One army job I'm very interested in is civil relations. The summary of the job is helping people in foreign countries. My lack of fluency in any language other than English may make things difficult, but that seems to be the only hurdle I will have. I feel like the news on world events I hear in your podcast is part of the reason I find interest in this job. The largest part, of course, is my desire to try to make an impact on the world and help people. I apologize for the length of this email as well. I apologize for the length of this email as well. Best regards, Rennie in East Tennessee. P.S. How do you feel about the military? Do you think it may change one's personality a lot? Why or why not? So thank you for your email. And, you know, some people feel very strongly about joining the military. You know, some people think that it's a good thing, that it's something that, you know, maybe even everyone should do. Other people are vehemently against the military completely. Now, while I don't believe in compulsory military service, I do feel, and I encourage someone to join the military if that's what they feel their calling in life may be. It's something that you have to put some serious thought into, though. And, you know, obviously I have never been in the military, so look who's talking, right? I say that to establish that outright. But obviously, joining the armed forces, it's very, it's very variable. I imagine there are many jobs one could do in the military that aren't directly, you know, completely combat-related. Everyone envisions that you're out there in the Middle East somewhere hauling around, you know, your machine gun, and you're getting, you know, shot at by insurgent groups from all angles, and, you know, you're at the verge of death at any any given moment. Granted, I'm sure there are, you know, certain... positions you could get that, you know, that might be what you would be doing. Um, but granted, there are so many things that you could also do that may not be, you know, that intensive. So... If you want to join the military, I understand a, a big reason why I think a lot of folks do. Number one is the financial incentive. 
Yes, indeed, certainly from a financial point of view, there can be incentive. Another reason some folks may want to join the military is if they really don't know what their calling in life is. You know, they don't know what they want to do, but they have to do something. Well, that is a way upon which one can serve their country dutifully, and also perhaps, you know, discover a sense of purpose and maybe find what their calling may be. You know, similarly to that, there might be the chance to go in and make a change in the world. One thing that I think holds true in regards to a lot of military personnel, <laughs> killing people is not the only thing that personnel in the armed forces do. Yes, combat is a major role, and that I think is what it's best uh, known for, but there are many other very important things that are done that I don't think get as much coverage. Yes, many very positive humanitarian miss missions are carried out by the military. Many massive logistical undertakings are. Helping others, keeping people safe, these are all some very important things that get done as well. So I completely, I understand where you're coming from in wanting to join the military. And if you have done your research and you think it's the right thing to do, I encourage you to pursue that. Give it a shot, see what you think, and maybe it is the right thing for you. Like I said, I know it has helped a number of individuals who have been lost in life, but I know that it's not something that's for everyone. And one thing that if anyone has any thoughts about joining the military, any whatever branch it might be that you know you're thinking of, do your research. And by that I mean research it day in, day out. Don't make a spur-of-the-moment decision, but please just factor in all the aspects of it. Read articles, watch videos, watch everything. Try to get a rounded impression of it, understand the good, understand the bad as well, and see, and honestly ask yourself, deep down, and you're the only person who would know this answer, is this something that I might want to do? And... That might be a yes, and by all means, give it a shot and see what happens. But if you have reservations, then that's something that I would say to reevaluate. And in the end, you know, it's up to you. You have free will. Make the choice that's best uh, suited for you. But I mean, again, I understand where you're coming from, especially it seems like maybe the music, you know, it's just something that you enjoy doing it, but is this really something that you want to do forever, right? Or is it something that you'd like to do on your own terms, on your own time, you know, when that motivation is there, rather than being forced to do it? Uh, so I understand that could be one thing. So I wish you the very best of luck. I hope it goes over successfully, and uh, I hope you're able to get where you want to be. And, um, well, who knows, if you have to learn another language, I hope that your language learning experience goes over better than it did for me, because I, well, I, I didn't do a good job when I tried to learn Spanish, and that just kind of fell flat on its face. So hopefully, you know, that'll be, um, it'll be an experience. And I think it depends on the individual. I think there are folks who have been changed by it in very positive ways, but again, you have to understand there have been folks who have been changed by it very negatively and have been severely jaded by it and have gotten some severe uh, PTSD and experiences through it. So that's just why I would encourage one to just do vigorous, vigorous research, understand what you're getting into, and then once all that's said and done, if it's something that you're still considering... Well, then put your best foot forward and uh, give it a shot. Now, as for me, the military just isn't, it's not for me. And, uh, you know, even if I wanted to, I just don't think I have what it takes. I mean, look at me, for goodness sake. Do I look like a soldier to you? So I'll just, I'll just remain here behind this desk at the microphone. Um, but again, I think I've established my, my viewpoint. So best of luck. Let's continue the broadcast now with an email coming in from Ali. 
I'm forcing myself to write this email finally, because although I've listened to your podcast for over a year, and have been so incredibly compelled to correspond with you, I can't seem to bring myself to actually do it. Every podcast, I have countless thoughts, comments, questions, and ideas, but I always feel silly at the idea of writing to you. I think it's because, given the amount of time I've spent listening to you talk, it's hard not to feel like I've gotten to know you a bit, and in turn, isn't it creepy or embarrassing to write someone who doesn't know you back? Even this email, I've written and deleted paragraphs multiple times because, well, frankly, I guess I'm nervous. Do I ask a simple question or two? Do I explain a little bit about myself? Should I go on about the impact that you have unknowingly made on my life? It all seems so presumptuous of me to take your time to say what I want to say. Uh, To interject, I always say at the beginning of the mailbag program, and I say it with sincerity, I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it, the purpose of this program is for listeners to correspond as they wish, and one should treat it as a clean slate that you could write whatever you would like, long or short, as frequently or infrequently as you would like, and you never have to write at all. Uh, Some listeners write in for every single broadcast. Uh, Some never write, of course, many never do. It's up to you, and write and correspond to whatever extent and degree you are comfortable. Continuing, I will say this, though, this year has been very rough for me. It's the first year of my life that I wished I had a single friend to talk to about my problems in life. After hearing you encourage your listeners to take the floor, or write about whatever we want, it touched me so deeply that on extra severe days it almost brought me to tears. I can't believe there is any human out there who would want to hear out what I have to say. And yes, of course, I know you're not talking directly to me, Don't think I'm some sort of crazy, obsessed fan who's delusional, but still, it's an awesome gesture. It's empowering, even though I have yet to take advantage of it. Again, to interject, thank you very much. It it really means a lot to me to know that this broadcast has actually impacted you in such a way, and it really does mean a lot to me. Uh, To continue on, you say, I think I've waited so long to email you because I wanted to make a good impression, and I'm definitely not doing that here. I know we'll never get to know each other personally, and I know you get a ton of emails about a wide range of things, and I know that each uh, that this email has basically zero substance, but I thought maybe if I force myself to write at least something, I could open the door for myself to actually feel like the things I have to say or ask are worth the risk of embarrassing myself. I guess I really hate doing anything that people could potentially judge as attention-seeking, including writing to you, who I have admired from afar for a while. In the end, I'll end it with asking you a couple questions I've wondered for quite a time. Please, if these are inappropriate, irrelevant, or uninteresting, don't feel obligated to respond. Question 1. I'm not one of those people who believe personality assessments are super accurate or anything, But I wonder what your MBTI personality type is. I am an INTJ, and notice the people I tend to be drawn to the most are other INTJs or ENTJs. So I'm curious if you've taken the assessment and what they claim your type is. So, number one, I'm very familiar with the, um, what is that, the Myers-Briggs test, right? The, uh, MBTI test. And I know there are a wide variety of uh, sites, and I've known of this test for years. I think I've known of it since, might even be as far back as 2011. I remember I heard of it somewhere, and I took the test. And I know that my results have changed over the years. Now, for the sake of your email, I took the test again um, today, I'm just out of curiosity as to what uh, result I would get these days, because I know that my result has changed. It, it has over the years. I know just off the top of my head, over the past, uh, when I've taken the test, some of the results that I have gotten. I remember there was a time where I did get INTJ personality. 
There was a time where I got INFP personality. When I took the test and I spent some time just answering it honestly, uh, the result that I got today was INTP personality. So that's what it is this time around. But I know that it is proven that if you take the test after various intervals, you know, based on just how you are at that time, uh, the answers will differ and it can change. Um, so right now, I suppose what I have is INTP personality. I took the test from 16personalities.com. Uh, some people have criticized the ta the um, some people have criticized the site, but I have been using that site consistently for probably the last decade. So I figure that's a good, you know, control group, so to speak, because it's a, something that I could compare it to previously, and it's just interesting. And I like it. I think it's a nice test, and um, so that's just what the result is. And you're not the first person to ask, but I think this is the first time I've answered this question, at least in a while. So you also have a second question. Um, again, another personality test, I'd be interested to know your results. Uh, if you would take the time to take it, is the Enneagram test type. Is the Enneagram type test, and I apologize if I mispronounce that. I'm a type five and have found the results of this test to be surprisingly accurate, especially because the questions made me roll my eyes and think this is BS. Now, I had never heard of that test, and but again, I took it before I began recording today. So, I had never taken the test before, and as I was taking it, I don't remember how many questions there may have been in total, I think over a hundred, but it went by pretty quick. And I remember looking at some of the questions, thinking to myself, you know, some of these questions are incredibly narcissistic. And to me, I don't understand how anyone could answer them another way, because it just seems like, I don't know. It just, I, I don't know how some people could answer them that way. Um, but anyway, I took it. I don't remember what site I used, but it gave me a number of types, and it told me the percent, I suppose, that I applied to each type. So I jotted down the three types that I guess I scored the highest with, both of which were very um, strong, and then the other ones were all much, much lower. So the type that I got the most at 98% was type 5. Uh, which goes by the name The Investigator. Then after that was Type 9 at 97%, The Peacemaker, and then at 96%, Type 4, The Individualist. So I thought that was interesting. Again, it was an interesting test. And um, that's for question two. Question three, um, just keeping that question off air, uh, my answer to that is both. It would be exactly the same if I had this YouTube channel or if I didn't. So thank you for your questions and thank you for your email. Again, it means a lot to know that this program has, you know, impacted you in this way. And I most certainly hope that, you know, your situation, whatever it might be, uh, certainly does improve. And I hope things get better for you. So, you know, just remember, as uh, should any listeners, you're always welcome to correspond uh, with whatever you wish, as frequently or infrequently as you would like. You know, that's why I do this program, so I can hear from listeners. If I didn't want to, I wouldn't do this uh, mailbag program. And, I mean, easily the mailbag portion of VORW has been uh, consistently the longest-running feature of this show. I've really started doing the mailbag program since 2014, I think since maybe May of 2014, pretty soon after I started the show. And as long as I've been doing this, I've never stopped it because I value what you guys have to say. And it's always a lot of fun to break open the email and the variety of correspondence never fails to, never fails to amaze. 
it never gets boring, it never gets repetitive. So, all are welcome here. Thank you again for your email. Continuing with the broadcast, we hear next from Thomas in Alberta, Canada, writing, Thanks very much for covering my letter in the last show. Your thanks and well, wish, well wishes <laughs> are appreciated. Uh, to interject, this is the individual who uh, wrote in regarding the med school interview. Continuing, my med school interview went well, or at least I hope so. Now begins the long wait of two months before I hear back from them. In the meantime, I am attempting to learn Latin. Have you ever attempted to learn a so-called dead language? The process is interesting and going good so far. I hope you're doing well. So thank you, Thomas, in Alberta, Canada. Well, I'm really glad to hear that the interview went well. That's exactly what I had hoped to hear um, if you were to write a follow-up, and I'm glad you did. So um, really, congratulations on that. Hopefully you'll be able to get that good news two months from now. And uh, really, best of luck, my friend. Now, you know, as I kind of hinted with language learning uh, previously, I really wish I was better at learning languages than I am. I tried to learn Spanish, which I know those who are far more talented than I am in regards to linguistics, I imagine consider one of the easiest languages you could possibly learn, and I failed miserably at that, despite trying for years. I was told that Latin might actually be a pretty easy language to learn, but I never bothered because what's, you know, they tell you, what's the point? I actually could have learned Latin in high school. It was actually offered, but I was talked out of it. I was tempted to, but I never did. Uh, one, you know, there's actually, on the shortwave, there is one station that still broadcasts in Latin seven days a week, multiple times a day. And, you know, do you want to take any guess at what station that might be? Vatican Radio. You know, that's where Latin is still kind of used, you know, not, but, you know, traditionally in the Catholic Church. So Vatican Radio still broadcasts uh, twice a day on four frequencies in Latin. Vatican Radio, they have a powerful transmitting station um, located near Vatican City. I think it's just to the north of Rome, and it's called Santa Maria di Galleria. And uh, it's very big. I think it has a, a good number of transmitters. One thing that I always applaud uh, Vatican Radio, their transmitting site for, I really think when it comes to shortwave, they have some of the best audio processing that I have heard of any station. I mean, really, I just have to commend them as to how robust, crisp, and clear the uh, audio on the transmitters at that site are. And, you know, they broadcast Vatican Radio in many languages, including Latin, um, they also have some really good antennas, so sometimes a lot of the broadcasts from Vatican uh, City, pretty much, despite targeting elsewhere, uh, can be heard in North America, which is a good opportunity for any listeners who may be unintended, um, you know, recipients. So, for instance, you know, a few broadcasters use the site also, like the Voice of America, the BBC World Service, and a few stations to Africa that I find interesting. And sometimes the signals inadvertently come in very strong in North America, so I'm able to enjoy the programming. But that's an aside. Of course, in addition to all of that, Vatican Radio broadcasts um, Latin... Well, they broadcast the liturgy in Latin... on three frequencies, 20 minutes a day. 
but then much longer for 40 minutes they broadcast a traditional Latin mass uh, on the short wave and I think it's actually because this site it, it says it's liturgy but when I really think about it I don't think it's a liturgy I think it's actually the um, the rosary in Latin because I was looking at the time and the frequency and I thought I've listened to this before and um, yeah it's not liturgy that's the rosary in Latin that they broadcast You know, the one the one prayer of theirs that I, I think I do know pretty well in Latin is the Hail Mary. You know, I can certainly, I can just rail that thing off. Because I've heard it so many times on the, on the shortwave there. But that's about the extent of my knowledge in Latin. So I could say, yeah, I know a couple prayers in Latin because I've listened to Vatican Radio a couple times and that's it. But that's all that I have. Funny, funny topic, though. Yeah, kind of cool. Latin, you know? I guess it is a dead language in some respect, but not completely dead. Obviously, it's still used to a certain extent. All right, we hear from Roman, who says, I emailed you once back in 2018 when I was living abroad in Southeast Asia. I'm back in sunny England now and still listening. I think your show is really something special. I find it perfect for relaxing, and it's one of the most thought-provoking shows I can find on Spotify. Unfortunately, that makes writing this email a bit tricky, as there are loads of things I could ask. I'll get right to my question. Have you ever considered the idea that you could be immortalized, even in some small way, by you making and sending out this show? I am in the process of compiling a film library for myself, and have decided to include Dante's Inferno, which was made in 1911. Upon watching some of it, I immediately wondered if anyone involved in making of that film gave any thought to the idea that someone would be watching their efforts 110 years later. With the internet being as permanent as it is, it's possible that there could be people acknowledging or even listening to your show long after we are both gone. Do you find any comfort in that? Or maybe it's a bit unsettling. I imagine lots of people get into showbiz because they want to be immortalized in a similar way. I hope this idea was as interesting to you as it was to me, and if you do read this email in your show, I'd like to say hello to anyone listening in the far future. Sincerely, Roman. Well, thank you, Roman. I'm tuning in now from sunny England. Well, the topic of being immortalized, certainly an interesting one. And certainly, I think one's views regarding it uh, depend really on one's own stance at life and death, etc. Uh, obviously, if someone wants to be immortalized intentionally, I'm not going to uh I'm not going to criticize one for wanting to you know just leave their mark on the world that's I think maybe that has to do with human nature. I know a lot of people want to, so there's nothing wrong with that um as for me, it was never my intention to be immortalized, and if I die tomorrow and let's say I never had this YouTube channel or anything, and I died, I didn't know anyone, and after I'm buried and dead, you know, very few people in this world even knew who I was, and then I'm just forgotten, I don't care. I, I don't care one single bit. And like I said, if I die tomorrow, and not a single person uh, even knew, and I just dropped dead, and I just rotted away right here on the floor, what do I care? <laughs> I don't. So, no, oh, that doesn't bother me one single bit. Um, no, it's, uh, it doesn't bother me. Let, you know, let it, let it be forgotten. I, uh, I don't mind. <laughs> What's it to me? So, no, I don't have any, you know, any 
inclination, if that's the right word, to be immortalized in any way, shape, or form. Although I do realize that, you know, because of what I do, these shows, these videos, and likely the fact that, you know, the internet, to some capacity, will be around for probably a very long time. And I'm sure some of the material available on the internet, much of which will be forgotten, but some of which will continue on for generations, uh, will probably be around long after I'm gone. And, you know, maybe in the 2100s, someone will watch a video of mine or listen to an excerpt of a broadcast of mine. And that is pretty funny to think. You know, it, it's a funny thought, but, you know, that's just how it is. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. If no one ever sees it, that's fine. And if people do, they do. It is a very interesting concept, though. And it had never been a goal of mine, but I guess that's something that I suppose will probably inadvertently happen. What is kind of surreal to think is that... I think when we say immortalized, you know, it's, um, well, that term implies, you know, the far future. I mean, by that, you know, you're thinking 100, 200 plus years from now. But I know I can't predict anything, you know, going forward. Um, but just, you know, just assuming the nature of how things are. I'm sure that there are a number of people, who knows how sizable, but I'm sure that there is a number of people out there right now listening to this broadcast and watching my videos that are going to outlive me. And I think that's an interesting thought in and of itself. I mean, I would just say looking at the situation and going purely by the numbers, I think that's perfectly reasonable. So it's just an interesting thought. Uh, real interesting. Thank you for some good discussion. Let's go on to our next email. We've got a couple more to read in the program. Let's see how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight more emails to get to in the broadcast. Next we hear from Sigmund in Munich, Germany who just has a few thoughts that he would like to share, and we'll leave it at that. Writing. I think that all people are the same in terms of temperamental cognition and both conscious and unconscious reactions, though I believe that people varies depending upon what ideologies or beliefs they're in, grew up, or fixed with. Considering the conservatives... And I believe that ideas have people, thus tribalism, cultural differences, politics, etc. Like I said, all people think the same in terms of temperamental cognition, and if they said something dishonest, unreasonably good in virtue, I know that they are uttering words which they do not mean. This is why I do not trust a lot of people, especially strangers, who act in an altruistic manner. Why? Because trusting, people will, because trusting people will make you drop your guards, which basically makes you vulnerable to different kinds of attacks. I mean, everyone can have companions of their own, but one must not give its 100%, let alone 50. I've experienced this mistake before, and I know that right now, I'm talking to you, Review Bra, a person like everybody else who are outside my realm that I will never see in real life and vice versa. I learned that all is but a facade, and this is why perception is the hardest thing to recreate. Deceit is everywhere, and it is very appalling and inevitable. I'm kind of frightened about things right now, to be honest, and that's why I'm gathering different views from the internet and courage from a psychologist guy on YouTube. 
I believe that all is imperfect, and we live in a life of adversity and survival. We live in a music score where everything can be ruined by just a wrong note, and that's why facades are everywhere. So that was an email and a few thoughts from Sigmund in Germany. I think he, he sent the email about a dozen times, so we got to it. Thank you for your thoughts. Some views on humanity in general. And I think I was able to get the gist of it. Of course, that's your view. I could certainly draw some parallels, so I can't say I necessarily see eye to eye. Um, but I do believe that, yes, there are a number of dishonest individuals. And yes, sometimes, you know, as a metaphor for life in the world, it could be like a music score, and it just takes one one bad person to uh, really ruin it all. That's not always the case, but sometimes that is how it is. So, I mean, I understand in some ways where you're coming from. We have a lot of emails from anonymous listeners. I think of the next number of emails I am to get to, we have... Let's even see. One, two, three... Three or four anonymous emails, which is perfectly fine if one wishes to preserve their anonymity. I will, I will respect that. So, let's get into one of these. How about we start with this one? We'll just work our way down. From an anonymous listener. I've only started listening to your podcast three months ago, and I thought I'd show some of my appreciation for all that you do. At first, I started listening to the podcast to find something to keep my mind off of my obsession with food because I couldn't stop thinking about the amount and time of food, but I never really actually listened to them, but started pretending to be interested in the topics you're talking about. But one day I actually started listening to what you were talking about and I found something else, how amazing you are at talking and keeping up a chat. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you have helped me recover from anorexia and for what you do and hope more people can find this podcast because you deserve so much more love and support for this amazing podcast. Keep it up. I'm currently doing much better with the anorexia. Please keep up the great work. So thank you so much for your email. And whoever you are, I commend you. I truly do. Though it's not something I personally experience, I've certainly researched anorexia, and bulimia as well, and I know how awful that they can be, just how damaging they can be physically, psychologically, etc. So I truly just offer you my utmost congratulations and support for being able to overcome this. I know it must have been really difficult, but I'm glad, to the best of your abilities, stay the course, and I hope things continue to improve for you. So thank you very much. And I suppose on a similar line to some of the emails we've received in this broadcast, it utterly amazes me, you know, the impact that this show actually has on people. I know that these emails are genuine. I know that these emails are legitimate. You know, I, I know that this show must really help some folks out there. But sometimes when I when I look at myself, I don't understand what it is that I do that's of any help to anyone. I feel like I just sit here and exist, and uh, that's it. But I know that, you know, taking even the microphone here and doing these programs, well, I know that it genuinely does <clears throat> assist some folks. So just know that it's oftentimes listeners like you and emails like yours that really give me the motivation and, as I've said, word for word, but with total sincerity, the inspiration to keep all of this going. So thank you for your message of support, and it means a lot that you took the time out of your day to send that to me, so thank you. We next hear from another anonymous listener in Europe. Social anxiety can severely decrease people's quality of life. 
Humans are supposedly social animals, yet more and more people are suffering from social anxiety in today's world. It seems irrational, but it is very real for those who suffer from it. What do you, why do you think social anxiety exists? Is there some evolutionary purpose to it? Or is it a consequence of people becoming more and more disconnected from each other? So to answer your, your first two questions, or I guess first three questions, well, I would imagine that social anxiety, maybe it's a form... I mean, I think there are different levels of social anxiety, too. Obviously, it's very well established that people can be introverted and extroverted. And, you know, you have people who are more introverted than others. You know, there are different levels of introversion. There are different levels of extroversion as well. So sometimes I think social anxiety, in some cases, is a healthy manifestation of stronger introverted tendencies. That person just doesn't want to be in a busy public place. They would prefer to be by themselves, and I see nothing wrong with that. Now, is there an evolutionary purpose to it? Initially, I think not. But, and, and this is just highly theoretical and really just original research, so I encourage you to disregard this. But sometimes I wonder, what if social anxiety is almost a type of, you know, defense mechanism against some of the evils that other people are capable of doing? You know, it's like your body's way of warning you that there are many dangers in this world, including other people. Maybe it's best to stay away for your own good, you know? What if that's the case? So, I don't know. I don't necessarily believe that, but that is a thought that I have, you know, I have pondered from time to time, and I, I see some legitimacy in that, but like I said, that just is what it is. Um, You know, but could it be a consequence of people becoming more and more disconnected from each other? Well, I don't know. Here's the thing, you know, I think about, if anything, in some ways, we are more connected now than we ever have been. I mean, look at this. I'm sitting here at the microphone and I'm answering emails from people all around the world, which heretofore I really wouldn't have any opportunity if it weren't for the internet. Now, you might say, yes, before the internet there was postal mail, true, but this allows for the near instantaneous uh, receipt of communication and potential response. But again, you think, you know, back to, uh, you know, connection or disconnection from the world, you know, go all the way back to, you know, even the 1700s, when you really didn't have, you know, you didn't have any electronic communications, the telegraph wasn't even around then, people maybe had their immediate circle, but especially those who lived in more rural locations, really weren't that connected. You know, then you think back to some of the first settlers in the New World, that how long that would have taken, you know, seeing the same people every day and some of the isolation they might have faced. So I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um... But one thing that I do feel is that, you know, internet consumption and social media consumption, smartphone usage, etc., should be moderated. It shouldn't just be something that's done 24-7. But like myself, I am an outlier in terms of, I think at this point for someone my age, my childhood, internet use. I did not use the internet for any sort of casual browsing until I was about 13 years old. Before that age, despite it being the 2000s, I had a computer but with no internet. I didn't have a phone or a smartphone or any of that. I didn't even know what any of that was. I didn't want one. I was happy without anything like that. I used the computer for any schoolwork that might have required it. 
which wasn't really a ton. And otherwise, I was happy, you know, just passing the time in other ways. So I was not a huge internet user at all. Yet, even at that young age, I had social anxiety. So just using myself and my own experience, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that is the sole um, reason for that, but maybe in some instances, but I'm not sure. Again, I think that social anxiety isn't necessarily an evil thing. And controversial this may be, I think in some ways it could be helpful, uh, though I think it's more harmful than it ever is helpful, but there can be times where sometimes staying in can literally save your life. But that's for another day. You continue. I would like your thoughts on how over a year of COVID isolation has affected mental health and social anxiety in the world. I read an article saying that the lifting of COVID restrictions could trigger anxiety for people who have to return to school or work since they have adjusted to the safety of living at home. If you're stuck at home, you don't have to leave your comfort zone. For many people with social anxiety, working from home has been quite comfortable. However, the limited exposure to social interaction could worsen anxiety when returning to the outside world. Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult thing. Um, I think it depends person to person. I imagine that there have been many instances, yes, where the COVID lockdowns, the restrictions, the stay-at-home orders, etc., have been detrimental um, to individuals' mental health and well-being. And the prospect now of returning back to the office, back to the school, ceasing the working from home uh, really could cause bouts of anxiety. That's understandable. I think the good news for those who maybe have those anxieties, though, I think some companies will realize, as a result of this whole COVID pandemic, that working from home or remote work could be practical, accomplishable, and perhaps, if the individual so chooses, could be a permanent uh, option for some. That's just what I see some companies doing, but some will say, right, you got to go back to the office now. You know, if they try to force one to get vaccinated, or if, let's say, the situation in regards to the spread of the virus is deemed, you know, low enough that there's few cases and it's safe to reopen things, that they'll just say, all right, it's time to get back in here, whether you like it or not. And that's that. I think it's just one of those situations where what's done is done and it's unavoidable. And I hate to be so blunt, but, you know, the lockdowns and everything, this is already done. I mean, what's already happened, happened. And I think the toll of it has been, you know, harder on some than others. Like for me, this last year, what does it bother me? I hate going outside. <laughs> you know, so what do I care? It doesn't bother me one single bit. But I'm not going to sit there with, you know, that sort of cocky attitude saying, well, look at me, you know, I don't like going outside. So quit your whining and quit your complaining because you have to stay at home. And, um, you know, everyone perceives things differently. You know, some people not being able to go out and socialize and be with their friends and go to work, go to school, go to restaurants, go to the malls, the stores, etc., the concerts, uh, etc., right, is a lot more taxing negatively on the mind than it would be for me, someone who hates going to these places to begin with and actively avoids it. You know, so you can't sit there and pretend like just because I'm incredibly introverted to the point of reclusion, you know, I really will consider it that when I really just look at it plainly. You know, everyone else should perceive it this way, too, because I do. I think that's ignorant and idiotic. So, uh, that's my take. Thank you for your email. We hear from Brooke, corresponding as follows. Good afternoon. The recent topic on visual snow and other stories without... about seeing imagery when you're trying to fall asleep were really interesting to hear about. I can't visualize anything. 
To put it simply, I don't have a mind's eye. Someone says, think of an apple, and I just know what an apple is. I can't picture one in my head. The condition I have is called aphantasia. Along with not being able to visualize, it also makes it to where I am unable to recall smells. I can't think of what an apple pie smells like, or what my grandma's house smelled like. I also have no inner monologue, meaning I don't hear a voice in my head. I'm not sure if these things are related, but I find it really interesting to hear about how people picture things and what their inner thoughts sound like. Thank you for reading, and keep up the good work. So thank you, Brooke. Interesting to hear, you know, that... because I, And I, I'm familiar with this, and I've seen the example with the apple before, where, like, they show... Think of the apple, and then they have five, you know, instances of how it could be visualized. One, you know, including hyper-realistic imagery, the other somewhat realistic, then the other is, like, two-dimensional with color, two-dimensional black and white, and then nothing, or something to that extent, anyway. And, you know, it is real interesting to, uh, to just see that, you know, a lot of people's minds are different. And obviously, some people can do this stuff, some can't. But just because one can or can't, I don't feel makes anyone you know, greater or less uh, of an individual. You know, I myself, it's almost to the point where I would almost go as far as to say that it's like my mind is almost too active sometimes. Though I'm not expressive, a lot goes on in there, sometimes for better or for worse. Um, you know, but I do have the inner monologue. It's, you know, it's like I'm perpetually stuck in some sort of old uh, noir film, you know. It's <laughs> kind of funny like that, you know, the narration style. And, you know, same thing when visually imagining things, so to speak. Obviously, there's not necessarily any sort of place that it really physically occurs. It's just in the ether. But, you know, when you were mentioning the example with the apple, like, I was able to visualize that entire chart with all the examples of the apples and everything. Like, I'm visualizing that right now. And obviously, I see it, but I don't see it. You know, I'm looking at this light that's on the desk here, but I see it at the same time. Right? That's just imagining things. And again, the degrees that people imagine things, it is different. Some people see things in their mind, some people don't, some people hear the inner monologue, some people don't, but evidently, you know, you get some folks that try to brag about it, oh, look, I can see the, I can see the apple that looks like a number five on the chart or something, you get over yourself. Me personally, it's really interesting, you know, just like how I think it's interesting for you to think about these folks that, you know, can do these things, I think it's really interesting to me you know, the folks that don't, you know, and obviously there, is the, are, there are these differences, but here we all are in the end. So, I mean, I think that's really cool. So thank you for sharing that, Brooke. Good to hear from you. As I was uh, getting ready to read the next email, I opened up a web page, and uh, it reminded me, just to, um, for any shortwave listeners out there, anyone that enjoys hearing me talk about shortwave radio for some demented reason. Uh, there are two updates in the world of international broadcasting that I would like to uh, give. Two, I would say, good updates, you know, depending. But uh, just two things to make note of. Uh, number one, for listeners in North America, a shortwave station in Guatemala that has been off the air for a good number of months uh, due to what the uh, station manager described as years of severe neglect from their engineer, which I don't know if that's true or if they were just kind of throwing him under the bus, um, but they had some severe technical issues, I guess, due to neglect. And they were off the air for uh, many months, but um, it is reported that starting on the 17th, they're going to be back on the air, but at a low power while they're repairing the transmitter and testing it out. So if anyone wants to hear a uh, station from Guatemala, 
try the frequency of 4055 kilohertz at night. The station is Radio Verdad, broadcasting with 250 watts. Uh, normally, I think the transmitter is one kilowatt, um, but again, 250 watts, probably in Spanish, on 4055 kilohertz, but that's a signal coming from Guatemala, Central America. I know that, at least in certain parts of Central America that are still either very rural, impoverished, or developing, um, shortwave radio, it certainly still has its listeners in Central America. Uh, from what I had read, according to some audience research, a lot of the radios that get used down there are these old, you know, boom boxes that still have the shortwave band, and uh, that's how a lot of listening down there gets done. So, I imagine in Guatemala, I'm sure that station certainly had its base of listeners that are glad to have it back on the air, and, you know, it's primarily targeting Central America, but it can be heard in the United States. Your best chance is if you live in Florida, you could get it with a good signal, especially if you probably step outside at night. But anywhere, just give it a shot, and if you want to hear Guatemala, you might be able to. So that's some good news. Glad to see that they're getting back on the air. This day and age, a lot of stations if they run into a technical difficulty, and they're smaller especially, we'll just throw in the towel because they can't afford it, but uh, good to see that, you know, they're, they're repairing it, and that's always a good sign. Now, secondly, this is regarding Hong Kong and China. The Chinese government, starting this week, is introducing a new shortwave broadcast to Hong Kong and Macau. They're going to be syndicating the audio feed of China National Radio 7, the voice of the Greater Bay Area. Uh, normally it has only been heard on some AM frequencies and I think a few FM frequencies targeting, again, Hong Kong and Macau. There are no transmitting stations within those two cities so I guess they had just been trying to set up the transmitters, you know, right at the borders there and try to target uh, listeners there, which I guess now they've decided to try to expand and uh, offer some shortwave frequencies to any listeners again in Hong Kong and Macau. And I don't know how many people there listen to shortwave because I know that, you know, those two cities are certainly very, you know, developed, I would say and are certainly, you know, well-connected. But again, I know that shortwave listening is much more popular in Asia than it is in much of the world, with the exception of Africa and, again, parts of Central South America. I guess the Chinese government, though, deems there enough potential listeners in those cities to... um start up two broadcasts of this uh, transmission. And, I mean, they're going to be sending this stuff out with extremely high power. You know, we were talking about that station in Guatemala broadcasting with 250 watts. Uh, these transmissions are going to be with 450,000 watts. So very, very strong signals that I bet they're using such high power to make sure that it cuts through all of the electronic interference, you know, that might be in the city. So, you know, they could reach people maybe in the high-rises and stuff, surrounded by electronics, still with a clear signal, because, yeah, 450 kilowatts, that'll really get the signal there. Believe me, that's a bit overkill, but that's one thing that I know the Chinese government really likes to do with um, broadcasts. They go real high power to make sure that uh, that people can hear it, and needless to say, if I had the budget, you better believe I would broadcast my show with uh, 500 kilowatts if I could. But I haven't won the I haven't won the lottery yet. But yeah, one day, right? <laughs> but anyway, if someone in that area wants to listen, you could hear the broadcast. It'll be in Chinese on 95.70 kilohertz and uh, 13.810 kilohertz, and I think this is a 24-hour service.
So China continuing to uh, expand their shortwave broadcasts, and that doesn't surprise me. They're one of the last uh, countries left on Earth, I think, that still is taking such an approach to uh, shortwave. So, so I mean, whether one wants to admit it or not, China is uh, kind of propping the medium up in certain ways. Uh, it is. They're one of the last places also that's still training you know, new groups of electrical engineers who even know what they're doing with uh, shortwave transmitters. And then I think I talked about this in a previous broadcast, but then as a means of, you know, very, very unique foreign policy, um, you know, kind of in extending the olive branch to some countries in Africa, they'll actually send their teams of engineers over there and, you know, fix some of the transmitters that some of these African countries have that, you know, maybe are just in disrepair and, you know, they just don't have the personnel there to adequately fix it or get the, the right parts for it or whatever. So they'll send their teams over there, fix it up, make them sound good as new. And uh, it's really interesting. They did that with a station in Somalia. They did that with the station in Guinea. And most recently, um, I think last year, they revisited the facilities of Radio Mali, and uh, fix them up nice, so it's just a very unique uh, means of foreign policy. But anyway, just a short update on international broadcasting for anyone who's interested or uh, finds that of, uh, of note. Hey, I would rather hear about new stations coming on the air than stations going off the air, so at least we have some good news to report this week. More often than not, it's usually bad news, but I'm glad, I'm glad at least it's some good stuff. Yeah, you know, it was a real tough time. A real tough time when Radio Australia left the airwaves in 2017. They were a station that I thought that their programming was pretty high quality. And I enjoyed listening because they were a very serious international broadcaster... They transmitted on shortwave around the clock, you know, day and night with live programming. And they were one of the few broadcasts that was heard extremely strong and reliably in North America of this nature. Because, you know, the ABC the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, they managed Radio Australia, and they had a very powerful transmitter site in Shepparton, Australia, which I think is in New South Wales, so I might be wrong. And they just had a really, really efficient setup. So they would beam these high-power signals out you know, across the entire Pacific Ocean to serve all of the islands out there. Then they would also beam it up uh, to Papua New Guinea. They had transmissions to China, to Indonesia, uh, a few that would be able to shoot over to uh, India, and then a few very ambitious ones that made it all the way uh, to Africa and Europe. And obviously the transmissions targeting the Pacific, you know, especially since it's just traveling over water, were able to just reach North America extremely strong. And sometimes I would be able to hear Radio Australia 24-7, um, but more often than not, and I'll never forget the frequency, 9580 kilohertz, uh, it would come in uh, starting around 2 a.m., and it would come in crystal clear all the way up until around 11 a.m. or so when it would start to fade out. And I enjoyed the programming. They played some good music, too. They had this country music show that was good. And then they would syndicate sometimes programming from their domestic network. They had some music shows, I think, called Double J and Triple J, which played alternative rock music for the most part, which was awesome, and they would throw in, like, a lot of indie stuff, too, 
And uh, I would always discover some new songs on that. And it was just awesome listening. It was a good station. You could just leave on in the background, get some interesting programming, some good music too, and, you know, maybe learn a thing or two about what's going on in the world. And I didn't think that they really had extreme bias in their reporting, at least back then anyway. I can't speak for today. I haven't I haven't really listened anymore. But they had a following. I would say without a shadow of a doubt, they had at least hundreds of thousands of listeners across the Pacific, and at a bare minimum, you know, many tens of thousands of listeners still in the U.S. But then I remember in late uh, 2016, it was announced that the ABC was going to completely shut down Radio Australia um, permanently from the shortwave, and they were going to get rid of all the domestic shortwave transmissions that they had to the Australian outback, which you know, is still so incredibly remote that shortwave was still used as the main means of um, you know, broadcasting some news stations out there to people in very remote communities. And, you know, the management of the ABC, they gave the same old line that so many of these organizations do. They said, oh, well, no, no one listens anymore, and um, we're going to save a whole whopping... It was a measly... And mind you, you're talking about stations that have budgets in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and they were cutting this all away just for a measly six million dollars. You know, let me check that. Give me one second. It's even worse than that. You know, it's like, this is one of those things, you could tell that I, it still upsets me to this day. Um, well, you know, it's just one of those things, you revisit it, and then you realize it was even worse than I remembered. A measly $1.9 million. It wasn't even $6 million. That's three times as much. They did all this to save a measly $1.9 million. But they determined, well, you know, they said, oh, no one listens anymore, no one cares, it's a waste. And uh, we could save $1.9 million out of our budget of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions. And we can use this for um, improvement of uh, digital television in, uh, you know, the capital region. Uh, you know, they said, hey, anyone who listens, and we don't think anyone does, uh, go buy a satellite dish and deal with it. And let me tell you, they really did a criminal disservice by cutting that off because they announced that they were going to be doing this in December of 2016, and they finally turned the transmitters off in, I think, March of 2017. And in the months between then, you should have seen the outpouring that came in telling them that, no, people do listen, and people are going to be impacted. One of the only times I ever actually saw mainstream news organizations even write articles about the fact that uh, you know, a shortwave station is going off the air. I mean, <laughs> every single bit of common sense was pointing at them and telling them that you're making a mistake here, but, you know, they're set in their ways, and they don't care. I remember they were deluged with, you know, thousands and thousands of emails and responses and comments. You had a, a sizable number of members of the Australian Parliament that were even going to just forcefully uh, get them to restore it. Unfortunately, that never happened because, you know, their government never got into power. You had responses from radio manufacturers uh, talking about, you know, just the amount of radio sales that they've gotten you know, in the Pacific Islands. I remember even a few heads of state of these Pacific Island countries, they literally wrote to uh, Radio Australia and uh, told them not to stop the broadcasts, you know? I mean, from all over, you know, the, all over the place. I remember that there were plenty of people out there in the Australian outback who protested that too. But it all fell on deaf ears, you know? Now, they knew deep down that they really were hurting people by doing this, but they didn't care. I remember I talked about it extensively 
back on my show then, but, you know, it didn't do anything, obviously. And, you know, despite all of the protest and everything, they pulled the plug in early 2017. And again, I remember that. And that easily was, you know, because I've been listening to Shortwave for a number of years now, since, you know, 2013 or so, seriously. And, you know, a number of stations have gone off the air since then, but that was by far the saddest one I ever saw. Because, you know, not only was it a favorite of mine, but it was a station that I know was important and perhaps even essential to so many people. And, you know, when when it went off the air, I think I did, I, I legitimately, and I have no shame in saying this, I did uh, shed a tear. You know, it was it was sad to see it go. It really was. And you could find... There's videos of the shutdown. There was, um... Gosh, there's so many, you know, people filming their radios and stuff, but there's also a video from the transmission site, um, you know, from footage taken. I think it starts out with a broadcast of theirs from, like, the 60s, and, you know, then you see some footage taken earlier that day, and some clips of some of their shortwave broadcasts discussing the shutdown. But... In the end, it was just really sad, you know, because a lot of people were just left in the dark after that. So, you know, what I did, I think the day of the shutdown, I sent an email to uh, Radio New Zealand, which at this point, with Radio Australia gone, Radio New Zealand remained, I think, the last 24-hour high-power shortwave station, you know, exclusively serving the Pacific. And I sent them an email, and I I told them, just real straight up, I said, look, pretty much, you know, if you know what's right, you better send out a press release, an announcement, and let anyone you possibly can get in touch with, let them know that with Radio Australia gone, this station is the only alternative for continuous news and information for listeners in the Pacific and for those in Papua New Guinea. And they were very nice, they actually responded to me, and then they actually did. They, they actually did it. And um, at least I'm happy to see Radio New Zealand. They're the... Well, they're still there to this day, you know, and still going strong, so they're the last station that still targets the Pacific with such dedication. And I think evidently they realize that people are still out there listening. And on one final note, in a very, very humorous twist of fate, what ended up happening in, I think it was 2020, but Radio Australia's service to Papua New Guinea, which broadcast in, like, the local dialect, after they dropped the shortwave, they must have realized that they had such an abysmally low audience that could hear them online or on satellite that they actually went over to Radio New Zealand and they asked, could we please use your transmission facilities to broadcast, you know, a half-hour Radio Australia program to uh, listeners in Papua New Guinea uh, from the transmission facilities of Radio New Zealand? And, I mean, they said, sure, you know, by all means, if you want to get back on the air, we'll give you a half hour every day. You can use our transmitters and our antennas, and uh, you can broadcast the Radio Australia uh, service, you know, to uh, Papua New Guinea from our facilities. And that's been going every single day. So I guess in one form, Radio Australia still exists. It's kind of funny, though, that the station that I think their own management criticized is now literally the only thing even keeping their radio presence afloat these days. And, you know, good on Radio New Zealand. They're like an example of a of a model station that understands their audience and, you know, isn't going to give up on them. Oh, and that, and that reminds me, on one other note, I guess on another twist of fate, And we were talking about China and, you know, their utilization of shortwave. And again, 
love him or hate him, I, I have to credit China that this is this is a brilliant move on their end. It's kind of kind of scummy, but it's brilliant. What China Radio International did is pretty much in the weeks after you know Radio Australia left the airwaves, the frequencies that they used at this point, you know, were so routinely used by Radio Australia over the decades, they had just become very well known by their listeners as, uh, you know, the place on the dial where you can hear their station. So China Radio International, with these frequencies now being vacant, immediately pretty much comes in and fires up their transmitters out of China and begins broadcasting the English program of China Radio International to Australia and the Pacific on most of the former Radio Australia frequencies, you know, kind of as like an FU to them. And also to maybe take advantage of picking up some, you know, listeners who might have known Radio Australia and were looking for other stations to listen to. Oh, look, you know, hey, there is there is the Chinese government. Evidently, they care more about us and our news consumption rather than Australia, which left us in the dark here. So huh, let's let's give it let's give them a listen. Let's see what they have to say. See, that's another that's just another example of almost the soft power foreign policy that China employs in these just unique ways that most people just would never even think to do. But these are just things that China does through their foreign policy, like sending the engineers to Africa and, again, starting up their broadcast on these Radio Australia frequencies right when they left the air to kind of, you know, subliminally tell these listeners in the Pacific and Australia, hey, hey, maybe we kind of care more about you than Australia ever did, so that's something to think about. And I think they still broadcast on those frequencies to this day. That actually reminds me, in, in the short time, because after Radio Australia left the air, it was like a week or so before China, you know, swooped in. But during that week, I had a one-off broadcast scheduled to Asia that I was just going to do for fun. And I remember the, the, the broker who I was working with, who was going to, you know, hook me up with the transmitter airtime, he said, well, hey, you know, there's this transmitter in Uzbekistan, and the frequency that we can put you on is uh, 12085 kilohertz, which, you know, is one of the former Radio Australia frequencies that obviously is now vacant. You want to you wanna just go on that for the fun of it? I said, yeah, let's do it. So, you know, for one hour that week, I had the show go out on that, on that frequency, and yeah, the response was enormous. That was one of the most heard broadcasts I ever did. It makes me wonder if some of the folks who, you know, picked that up, maybe they were former Radio Australia listeners. I don't know. Just a fun, a fun memory there, you know, it's eh, just reminiscing. I overstayed my welcome on this subject and I apologize. Sometimes I can talk about this for really longer than I should. Let's continue on. We've got a couple more emails and uh, then that'll be it for the show. All right, and let's read the final batch of emails. Max, in Worcestershire, in the UK, writes in, I do want to say that I enjoy your podcast greatly, and I've tried to tune into the music show with the radio, but I'm assuming due to interference I can't get the best signal to interject. Yeah, the frequency that my show is on to Europe can be a bit hit or miss, but I certainly hope to improve things at some point, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Continuing, though... And uh, I find that even when discussing more mundane topics, you have a brilliantly calming manner of speech and end up making the topic really interesting. I greatly appreciate all the work you put into what you do, and I honestly find it inspirational to see how much you've managed to achieve in 10 years. Happy belated anniversary, by the way. From what I've heard from listener correspondence, you've had an immensely positive impact on the lives of many people, myself included, and I think that's an incredible achievement to have made. Similar to you, I've had an interest in radio for a long time, and I've been thinking about starting my own show on my university radio station, although this is a bit intimidating, since the other shows seem very loud and in your face, 
with energetic shouting from the presenters and over-the-top jingles. This isn't the sort of thing I'd like to do, so I've put it off for a year, but I'd definitely like to give a calmer sort of show a try. Do you have any advice for someone in my position? On a completely different note, I was wondering if you've heard of the band Public Service Broadcasting. They're my favorite band, and I think you'd find them quite interesting. They use samples from BBC Radio slash documentaries, and accompany this, accompany this with rock music, though they've experimented with different genres. A couple of their songs I'd recommend are New Dimensions in Sound and Theme from PSB. I'd love to know what you think about them. I'll certainly check those two out, and um, I'll certainly, you know, if what I could try to do is I could listen to them once I get this show done, and then in writing I could mention what I think of them. I'll do that. So I'll let you know off the uh, air. And as for your situation, well, here's the thing. I mean, I completely understand, you know. I don't often listen to FM radio, but obviously here in the United States, in some cases it can be very loud and noisy and boisterous and obnoxious. And, you know, some people like that, some people don't. You know, I think I prefer the more laid-back, relaxed, or, you know, more professional aspects of broadcasting that can still be heard on the shortwave and sometimes on AM. I think you should give it a shot, though. Now, here's the thing, though, and I just say this not to be demoralizing, but I just say it because this is just, I think, how the medium is. Radio is sometimes a medium that can be very hit or miss. And, you know, sometimes you could find great success, sometimes it just doesn't work out the way you hoped for it to be. I encourage you to do the show the way that you want to do it. No regrets. If you would like it just more relaxed, more laid back, more chilled out, or maybe just quieter and more professional, do it. You know, pitch the idea to the uh, station manager if this is... I don't know how it is. Maybe you can just do whatever you want to do and you don't need to even uh, ask anyone. But if you have to pitch the idea, you know, to the station manager, I would bill it as, you know, just say, not to be... Don't demean the other programs on the station, but just say something like, you know, look, I know a lot of the programming here is very energetic. I'd like this show to serve as an alternative for folks who might like something more toned down or chilled out or relaxed or you know, laid back, whatever adjective you'd like to use. See what they say, and hopefully any programming director that knows what they're doing will put you in a good spot that, you know, it won't be too overly conflicting, and hopefully it should work out well for you. And then, you know, have your best shot, put your best foot forward, and whatever happens, happens. The one thing, especially, you know, regarding localized broadcasting, like a lot of university radio stations are. Sometimes the audience that you're reaching, you know, just might not be as receptive to the programming as you would have hoped. Maybe they like the louder stuff, but in the end, do the show you want to do. Make the best of it. Most importantly, even if it doesn't get out to a wide audience or folks who aren't the most receptive to it, while you're you're there at the mic, do what you want to do, Be decent, of course, and have fun. So I wish you the very best of luck, and if you give your show a try, I hope you have fun, and I hope it is is a successful endeavor. Ryan in England checks in. I know he's a regular listener. He says, I have a good routine currently where I listen to your new podcasts on Spotify whilst I am out on a walk or working out, and I listen to the older VORW YouTube videos, night walks, and lectures when trying to sleep. Not to say you were boring back then, but the older style microphone just hits the spot and sends me off to sleep every time. To interject, absolutely do what works for you, and I know you've been... I say this not in any sort of demeaning way, but I know you've been a real hardcore listener, so it's always good to hear from you, Ryan. Uh, You continue... I can't remember what episode it was, as I've gone through about 40 episodes in a matter of a few weeks, but I remember you were talking about your yearly visit to the Pocono Raceway to watch the NASCAR. With all that's been happening this year with the virus and such, 
Do you plan on carrying on the tradition again this year? Will we get another exhilarating video recollection of the trip? Um, I'm not sure. I really don't know. I, it's just too far ahead to really determine what's going to happen and what isn't. You know, obviously there wasn't one last year. But again, I don't know what the situation is going to be looking like a couple months from now. And I just don't know. I, you know, it's just something that I have to... I have to see how I'm feeling. I can't make any promises. I'd say it's more likely that it won't than it will. But I don't know what the situation's going to be. I don't know what the numbers are going to be looking like in a couple months. And I don't know, you know, what the powers that be in charge are going to have to say in regards to large gatherings, you know, especially in Pennsylvania. So I really don't know. There's a lot of factors and variables that I just can't account for right now. But, uh, you know, I guess I'll just know when the time comes. You continue. I've been trying to get into NASCAR more this season. Seems like there have been quite a few action-packed races so far. I've taken on supporting Kyle Busch simply for the fact that his car has Skittles plastered all over it from time to time. Uh, and you also say, I was also curious if you watch any other racing series. Personally, my favorite sport to watch apart from the NFL is Formula One. Have you ever taken an interest in it? I feel this coming year would be a great time to get involved in the sport um, if you were ever to try it, as there's plenty of rule changes to even out the competition this year. So there's a lot more unknown than usual going on into the season. So thank you for your email, and that, you know, that's exactly fine. When it comes to picking a driver, a lot of people just say in terms of NASCAR, look, just pick a random number, just go with it, you know? Whatever car you like the best, go for it. If you want to just look into the personal conduct of every driver and pick your favorite, that's fine. But a lot of people, they look at the sponsors, they look at the car, they look at whatever, and they just pick it and go with it. Uh, as for Formula One... Of course, I'm very well aware of it, but I've never really given it a chance, so I've thought about it from time to time. Uh, that might be something that I'll just have to dedicate some time to. You know, maybe I'll try to figure out the schedules and when I could watch the races, and uh, then just give it a shot, and I'll see what I think. You know, sometimes, who knows, I'll watch it and I'll think, wow, this is really something. So uh, I'll certainly, especially like you said, with all the changes there, that might make for some interesting viewing. So thanks, Ryan. Good to have you listening. Always a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, let's continue on to our last email of the night. And then that's it for me. We've got Dan in the Netherlands, who I know has been uh, a shortwave listener and also a regular online viewer and listener. Hello, my friend. It's been two months already since we last spoke how time flies these days. Yeah, it certainly does. Good to hear from you too, Dan. I always like hearing from you. You write, I felt the need to answer this question about the suits because I also have noticed the amount of suits in public has gone down. Maybe suits will vanish entirely in a few years. Here in the Netherlands, suits are worn by politicians and newsreaders, yet even in these fields, it's in decline. Formal office wear nowadays seems to be jeans and a floral dress shirt. <laughs> I own six suit jackets and around eight dress pants. A large amount of them are the uh, older report of the week style. However, I do own one slim fit suit from five years ago, but I don't see myself wearing that again. I was thinking about talking about everything I own clothing-wise, but to save time, I made a list that you could find below. And, uh, yeah, let's see, let's see the, uh, wardrobe here. Won't necessarily go through everything, but let's see what we got. Six suit jackets, four are from the 90s and 2000s that I got from some second-hand sh stores. Eight dress pants, six of which, again, are that older style. Uh, one black formal vest, about... Uh, ten dress shirts, and I buy them new, but about one size larger so I can get a little more room. Uh, six sweater vests, different kinds. Three khaki pants, yes, khaki, 
with the funny voice. <laughs> yeah, it's, I didn't do a good job there, but I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> Two black polo shirts. Now, uh, let's see what else. Some undershirts, but no V-neck, unfortunately. Couple dress shoes, black sneakers, uh, 40 neckties, about 25 of which I actually use. And this is some of the clothing that I have that I'd rather get rid of, but I keep because I don't want the formal wear getting damaged or dirty. Uh, three pairs of jeans, three slim fit chinos, two random t-shirts, sneakers, two hoodies, and some more cla casual clothing I never use. So after making this list, I realized that I own quite a lot of clothing that I don't need or use, and I'll look into sorting everything out and donate what I don't want anymore. Now, to answer your question, I do wear suits, but not all the time. Now, when I say suit, I mean jacket, dress pants, and tie. I'd say that I wear a full suit around 50 days of the year, usually on some days where I don't need to go out too much or to places where people don't really know me, because dealing with people at my internship or at school is just a bit too much for me right now. I have done it, though. I just find it a bit scary and in your face when people ask you why you're wearing the suit and so on. So when I go out to places where people know who I am, I usually go for khaki pants with a dress shirt, sweater vest over it, and it's more stealthy so people don't start asking me about it and then I could sneak a tie into the outfit for fun. When I need to help out my dad in the yard or around the house, that's when I break out the jeans and hoodie. Not a big fan of the way jeans strangle my legs, but it's nice not having to worry about um, anything getting dirty whilst mowing the lawn or painting something. I really want to go formal every day, but because I don't really like the attention and just want to be a shadow everywhere I go, it's hard to do so. Maybe one day I could wear an 80s, 90s suit every day like you. Uh, there are people who buy clothing in the style of their favorite rapper, but me? Nah, just give me the suits. So thank you, Dan, over there in the Netherlands. A uh, good email, and I like that you broke uh, that you broke down the uh, wardrobe. And like we said, I think in one of the first emails of the show, I know that the reactions, you know, of those around you can be intimidating, and I I completely get, you know, why why you do what you've got to do. I I completely understand. I've been there before, so uh, it makes sense to me. You're using one of the same tricks that I have employed, too, especially when, you know, I had to go to school and I wanted to dress very nicely, but, you know, I wasn't going with the full suits just yet. That's exactly what I would do, too. You know, you put on especially a sweater and a dress shirt or a sweater vest, and that way you can kind of sneak in a tie, but it's not as obvious and people are less inclined to ask about it. Yep. That's something that I've, I have done that myself too, a number of years ago, back in like 2011, 2012, I have done the very same thing. But, you know, it all makes sense to me. No, it's, you know, it seems perfectly reasonable. I think some people might wonder, you know, well, what do I wear if I'm going to be doing like some sort of work around the house or in the yard? So here's what I do. And I think some people won't be all that surprised. I do not wear a full suit ever when doing, you know, like a lot of serious work outside that can get, can get you real dirty. But I have, you know, like I have my suits. I, I have a hierarchy. I have my suits. I have my dress pants, which are nicer. And then I have my dress pants that I say are more, like, durable, that might be still formal, still, you know, as I would wear them, but more like formal, you know, khaki pants or something. If I'm going to do yard work, I will wear a pair of those, you know, khaki pants, usually. Although, again, I have a couple pairs of dress pants that I consider more durable and can kind of you know, take the metaphorical, um, you know, beating of just, you know, scraping against stuff and whatnot, and whatever it might be, can deal with it, and that are washable, too, you know, they don't need any dry cleaning or anything. And 
I'll wear a pair of those pants. I'll wear a dress shirt. I'll have it tucked in. And sometimes I will have a tie on, usually just a tie I was wearing for the day. But, you know, I don't want to get the tie caught into anything. So I usually unbutton eh, maybe the second or third button from the top of my shirt. And in that little opening, I tuck the tie into my shirt and close the button again so it's just tucked into my shirt there so it doesn't get clawed into anything or it doesn't drip into any water or anything. And that's what I'll wear. And, you know, yeah, it might be strange, but I don't care. That's just, that's what I wear if I'm doing, you know, physical stuff that can get it, can get you dirty. Because in the end, if I get the pants dirty, I could just wash it. And if I get the shirt dirty, I can wash that too. And that's what I've been doing for years, and so far that's done me, that's done me good. But, you know, you gotta wear what you're comfortable wearing. It's, a lot of people would say you're out of your mind to wear this stuff for that, but it's just what I do. You know, and I'm sure I get strange looks, but I don't care. I'm just, I'm past that point anymore, but it just is what it is. I'm at the point where, you know, I've weared, I, I've worn, not weared, I've worn this sort of clothing for such a long time in my life now, that I would feel so strange wearing, you know, like jeans and a t-shirt to um, do some yard work as opposed to wearing a shirt and tie. Like, you know, you could say, oh, your brain is so fried at this point, you're so far gone. And maybe I am, but that's just, that's just the way that I am. And I try to be careful with what I do. Yeah, some things get dirty, but again, I specifically wear the outfits that could be washed. So no harm there. And I've been careful enough that I haven't lost any outfits yet. But again, this sort of clothing, if something does get damaged, I might be upset, but I'm not going to mourn it as I would, you know, if I lost a real good suit or something. So thank you for your email. And with that, we have reached the end of today's broadcast. I hope you found this program enjoyable, and I hope it was... Well, I guess it is what we make of it, isn't it? I hope it was enjoyable, though, and I hope it was a nice listen, and hey, you know what? If you use this to fall asleep, I hope you had a nice rest and some good dreams, too. You know, in the end, I think as we've covered a number of times in this show, individuality is a very important thing. Sometimes this world, and, you know, sometimes for worse, of course, the influences of society can really... What well, could bring us down, it can be very... It can, in some ways, be evil. It can be corruptible. It could have lots of nasty people that, you know, we're just doing something harmless that we enjoy doing, and they try to... You know, they make you feel like you're the scum of the earth for doing it, like wearing a hat, or trying to appear a certain way, something that's really harmless and innocuous, and folks really just try to demean you and bring you down over these truly trivial things. And in the face of that sort of opposition, it can be difficult. And yes, sometimes we do need to make adjustments. We have to make changes sometimes that we don't really want to make. But despite all of that, especially to those of you who might, you know, deal with those sorts of opposition, be that in person or online, whatever it might be, to the best of your abilities, try to stay true to yourself. And just try to keep the flame alive, even if it's not a ton, just try to do what you can to preserve your individuality. Like I said, stay true to yourself. I think it's such an important and precious thing in this day and age. Without hurting or harming others, try to do and be what makes you happy. And with that, that's all that I have for you. Thank you again for listening, and you could always reach me at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. I value and look forward to your feedback. Again, if you have any questions, comments, pieces of feedback, or anything you would like to share, it is more than welcome, and I'll try my best to get to it in the next show. Look, I've been here for hours and hours uh, getting to your comments this time around, and I'll do the very same thing next time. That is my promise that I give unto you. You could always reach me again at v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And with that, be safe, be healthy wherever you are, and I wish each and every one of you the very best. Thanks for listening. Take care. This is VORW.